Well, uh, welcome everyone and thank you for uh, attending the uh, Consumer uh, Advisory Committee meeting today. Um, so welcome to you all. Uh, let me call the meeting to order. Um, so we're gonna have introductions in just a second. Let me just start. I have a sign-in sheet if you wouldn't mind just checking off your name and we'll check later on because uh, we do have a, a recommendation uh, queued up later this afternoon. So we wanna make sure that we get a quorum so if I can, let me just start it around this way and we can come back Just see your name, check it off. If you sub substituted for someone else, just indicate that. Um, and then um, with that, um, uh, let's begin. Uh, just one thing I just want to keep in terms of uh, a protocol is if you uh, have a question or a comment you want to make, make sure you raise your hand. Um, that, that also helps uh, cue up the mics in the back uh, as well. So let's, um, let's begin the introduction. So I'm, I'm Steve Posios, I'm with the American Consumer Institute, um, and it's a pleasure to see you all. Let me turn it over to Debbie, and let's just go around and just do a quick introductions. Hi, <clears throat> I'm Debbie Berlin, representing the National Consumers League. Jonathan Howenchild, representing the American Legislative Exchange Council. Indiana State Senator Eric Cook, serving as a subject matter mm -hmm. expert. Sarah Legan, representing CTIA. Vonda Long of AT&T. Matt Gerst of CTIA. Steve Morris, NCTA. Lynn Follinsby, U.S. Telecom. Farhan Chaktai, U.S. Telecom. Uh, <clears throat> Michael Centrelli, serving individually. Uh, good morning, I'm Laura Gerberton, the alternate of Abby Johnson. Represents Nasuka. Good morning. I'm Bodan Zachary from Milwaukee PBS. Uh, good morning, uh, Brian Hurley, ACA Connect. Good morning. Good morning, Susanna of El Pepsi. We're the National Association of the Deaf representing the Deaf and Hard of Hearing Consumer Advocacy Network. Good morning, Jocelyn Day, Massachusetts Department of Telecommunications and Cable. Johnny Camp is serving individually affiliated with Taxpayers Protection Alliance. Sam Brinton, Head of Advocacy and Government Affairs for the Trevor Project, the nation's alter T suicide hotline. Christina Clearwater, Deputy uh, Designated Federal Officer. And I'm Scott Marshall, the Designated Federal Officer for the Committee. And um, do we have anyone online? Somebody who may be called into no. the bridge? Can we check? Susan Grant, Consumer Federation of America. Who was the first person? Yeah, Barry Umansky, Digital Policy Institute. Larry Wong from the National Association of Broadcasters. Yeah, it's Barry. Yeah, Barry was the first person. Yeah. Okay, good. So um, we'll have to uh, keep tabs on the, uh, uh, the attendance today. Uh, uh, approximately 11.50 today, uh, we'll need a quorum for our uh, uh, a recommended uh, uh, a recommendation that we're going to try to vote out. So um, with that, let me um, also uh, take a moment here to uh, thank uh, CTIA uh, for our food um, uh, that they're providing us with. Uh, uh, both the breakfast and lunch today. So thanks so much uh, for, for helping us out. So now um, I hope everyone has a, a agenda in front. We have a lot of uh, things to do, a few um, uh, slides and a video to queue up uh, and um, some uh, interest, uh, think inter interesting discussions on issues of 5G and, and a pilot program uh, and things such as that. So. Um, that uh, will be uh, uh, one of the uh, important items uh, for the day. So, uh, so Scott, uh, did you want to um, uh, start with uh, uh, a video? Or? I take it the, the, the chairman has not yet arrived? Not yet. Not okay. Yet. Um, why don't we talk about uh, in the interim uh, meeting dates? Yeah, okay. Potential so, meeting dates for the remainder of the year? Right. Or the remainder of this term? 
So a couple things. First, um, we're going to have a special uh, hybrid uh, teleconference, uh, and, and it will also be available as an in-person meeting on uh, February 13th from 2 o'clock to 3 o'clock. Uh, and this will deal with the um, robocall report uh, working group, mm -hmm. and there, uh, hopefully they'll have a recommendation for us. So it will be a, a, a special hybrid meeting. Again, that's um, uh, February 13th from 2 to 3. Our, our next uh, plenary meeting will be Friday. Tentatively, it's Friday, April 17th. So you want to mark your calendar and uh, let me know. Yeah. So that's uh, April 17th. That's the tentative uh, meeting date. And then the September meeting will either be uh, Wednesday, uh, September 23rd, or Friday, September 25th. Again, these are these are all uh, tentative dates in terms of the uh, our uh, quarterly meetings are concerned. Does the, anyone have any concerns? About yeah. The dates up does front? Does anything? Yeah. Does it? With meetings, that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Check on that. Let me know if there's a problem. Um, so that, that's kind of. Uh, uh, you know, we've, all we've done on that part is really just check with the availability of the room and that sort of thing. So we're, so we're good to go as far as we know. All right, excellent. And we'll send out a hold the date confirmation email. Right. As well, if, if we can't decide these dates definitely today. Okay, good. That takes care of that. All right. Um, we uh, wait another minute? Yes. Yeah, let's Wait a few. We just have a, a minute. We have uh, uh, the chairman um, uh, joining us to, uh, for a few com uh, comments, and he should be here in just any moment. Don't go away. <laughs> <laughs> Don't go away. He's on, he's on his way. Okay, he's great. Okay. Steve, I don't mind. In front of me. Oh, here it is. Here's the mic. Uh, yeah. Uh, just one uh, one further com comment. We'll have uh, lunch at uh, twelve ten, just after we consider the uh, caller ID authentication working group uh, proposed recommendation, and then we'll be back in the afternoon for some further discussion and also. Um, our last presenter, and then we probably will adjourn uh, shortly before 2 o'clock. Okay. So that's the remainder of the day. We're also going to circulate, a, uh, as an experiment, a, uh, a food and drink preferences sheet. Um, so that we can order food more intelligently for the <laughs> April meeting in terms of your preferences and all that stuff. I don't know if I can guarantee anything <laughs> as a result of that, but it'll at least give us an idea of how many, um, of which sandwich varieties to order and beverages and that kind of stuff. So let's see how that works in terms of going forward. If it does, we'll do it for each meeting. So, so starting us off then, uh, we have the chairman provide us some remarks. Thank you. 
Uh, thanks uh, so much, Steve, and I apologize uh, for being a little bit late. Uh, it was a wild night for me, uh, uh, needless to say. Uh, but uh, and that's why the traditional mug is not here. I've, uh, it's a little hungover, so I've got the substitute uh, here this morning. But, yeah, exactly. Uh, but I'm really happy to, uh, to be here this morning uh, with all of you. It's good to see uh, all of you here at the commission. And I want to give a special thanks uh, to our distinguished chair, Steve, and our vice chair, uh, Debbie. Um, and as you know, Debbie previously served as the a chairperson of the CAC for three terms, the fourth iteration. So I guess that makes you like the Feder Franklin Delano Roosevelt of the <laughs> Consumer Advisory <laughs> Committee. So, uh, but many more terms. You're not term limited in this regard. So, uh, but I did want to talk for a little bit about what our top consumer protection priority. And I know it is something that you have thought about a lot as well, which is tackling uh, the scourge of unwanted robocalls. I've already gotten a couple this morning, and it just drives all of us crazy. In the month of October alone, something like 5.7 billion robocalls were lo launched at American consumers. That's something like 2,115 every single second. And this is one of the reasons why American consumers are so frustrated every time they feel that phone uh, vibrate or hear it ring. And again, that's why it's our top consumer protection priority, but obviously the FCC can't tackle this problem alone. We need uh, the assistance of folks like you, consumer advocates who can help us address this issue. Uh, so we've done a few different things that I'm sure you've heard of before, but I'll just tick through very quickly. Uh, we've enabled phone companies to block calls that are highly likely to be illegal, coming from area codes that don't exist, for example, which is a pretty good sign. Uh, we've also clarified that providers uh, can, voice providers can immediately start offering call blocking services by default so that consumers don't have to proactively call their phone <coughs> company and sign up for those services. Uh, we've closed a loophole by banning malicious caller ID spoofing of text messages and foreign calls. Uh, we don't want to see uh, text messaging, for example, uh, become one of those services that is inundated with spam. Uh, we've also created a reassigned numbers database so those legitimate callers uh, who are trying to call a number that's been reassigned don't end up giving you uh, a hassle that was meant uh, for somebody else. We've also taken aggressive enforcement action against bad actors, including the largest fines in the FCC's history. Uh, we've issued advisories. Uh, every time we hear about one of these scams, for example, the one ring scam, where you might get a call in the middle of the night from Mauritania, and it would ring <laughs> just once, and it would try to entice the consumer into calling back, and uh, you know, that's the kind of thing we've issued advisories on. Um, and we've done a lot of webinars and uh, teletown halls, uh, thanks in part to our fantastic Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau. Uh, and while we're on the topic of outreach, I do uh, want to say I look forward to the recommendations that you'll be considering this afternoon regarding consumer education about the implementation of Shake and Stir, or Stir Shaken. I guess we have to go back to the Ian Fleming books to figure out what the proper order of that is. But <laughs> the important thing is that it's an, it's an improvement to caller ID authentication. And along those lines, and I don't blame you if you don't follow me on Twitter, but you might have seen that, uh, if, uh, that I had the first official cross-border call, uh, shake and stir authenticated call uh, with my counterpart in Canada, the chairman of the uh, CRTC, Mr. Ian Scott. And it was pretty impressive when he called me, I could see on my phone, Ian Scott, uh, or Chairman Scott verified. And it was something, I have to say, to be able to answer the phone knowing, okay, it is definitely Ian Scott. It's not somebody purporting to give me a free Marriott vacation or speaking in <laughs> Chinese or whatever. I mean, um, yeah, nothing, but, nothing against Putonghua, but I don't want to hear a language I don't understand. Uh, so anyway, this demonstrates our joint commitment uh, to this fight against robocalls. And I'm determined that we uh, continue to press this issue domestically so that we can finally help attack this problem, and I've made clear that I expect major voice providers to implement this framework by the end of this year, and if they fail to do so, we'll be taking action in the new year to ensure that they do. And so your recommendations on the needs uh, for caller ID authentication uh, back in February of 2018 was very helpful in getting us to this point today. I also want to thank you for a recommendation that you made in September that uh, service providers should notify consumers if calls that intended for them are blocked, uh, as well as offer consumers a call log of blocked calls or any similar tools that they can be able to access. And our staff is looking at those recommendations. 
Uh, so bottom line is there's no silver bullet to this problem. We have to take a multi-pronged approach and a multi-stakeholder approach. And so um, I just want to thank you again for all of your efforts on this issue. Now, uh, despite the fact that it drives everybody crazy, and uh, you, this isn't the only consumer protection issue uh, we are working on. And so I know you're looking at other issues as well. And continue to uh, be in touch with us. Give us your feedback and let us know what we can do to help advance the ball on behalf of uh, the public interest. Uh, with that, I don't want to belabor uh, my welcome, but I just want to thank you once again for all of your work here at the Commission and uh, look forward to working with you in the time to come. So thank you for uh, you inviting me. Yeah, um, do we have, you have a moment to just take a couple questions? Oh, sure, yeah. yeah so if anyone has a, a, a question, just... Uh, you know. About any of the topics, by the way, we have a lot of exciting stuff going on, including, as uh, some folks know, tomorrow uh, rolling out our pro my proposal, or hopefully adopting uh, my proposal, <laughs> uh, to establish 988 as the three-digit number for suicide prevention and mental health assistance. Uh, a lot of good stuff happening, so feel free to ask about anything under the sun. Any questions? Anyone on the phone? Well, if, if only congressional hearings were like this, <laughs> this would be great. Wow. Yeah, it's awesome. Chairman, <coughs> Chairman I'll, 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 I'll happily ask one. Um, so, obviously, robocalls. Oh, I'm sorry. And identify yourself. Uh, sorry, thank you. Sorry. I'm still learning the process. Um, uh, <laughs> you know Sam Brenton, uh, the Trevor Project. Um, Chairman, obviously, robocalls, everyone's talking about them, right? They're, they're, they're a nuisance. Um, there's a lot of different solutions that are coming forward. What do you think is the best? Um, what are, be, what are some proposals that you've heard on public education around this issue? Because I think, especially as we talk about suicide prevention, there's a lot of things that um, our phones are our lifelines, right? That they're our way to connect to people we really care about. And so educating ourselves on why these robocalls are a problem that we're dealing with, but you know, also what we can do about them, I think it's really important. It's not just about the technology, it's about the education. So what are some things that you've heard at the Commission around education on this issue? Uh, certainly, part of it is just getting out in the field and meeting consumers on their own turf. Uh, for example, I recently held a town hall uh, with, in coordination with the AARP out in Nebraska and meeting with a bunch of consumers, seniors who, you know, they might not think about going to the FCC's website, they're certainly unlikely to visit the FCC's headquarters and watch our proceedings. Uh, so I think it's important for people like me and our staff to get out there and to hold these kinds of fora where, uh, fora for you Latin sticklers, uh, where, uh, where we can tell people, look, this is some of the things we're doing, but also just the basic stuff that a lot of us take for granted. If you don't recognize the phone number, don't answer the phone. If you answer the phone, don't give out personal information. Don't say the word yes. I mean, those are the kinds of low-hanging fruit, so to speak, that I think a lot of consumers would appreciate hearing. Uh, the other part is being just very proactive in working with our federal partners. Uh, the Federal Trade Commission and state uh, consumer protection agencies do a great job in uh, helping get the word out. And along those lines, uh, uh, what was it, a month ago, I guess it was, uh, I was in Boston, Massachusetts, where along with Governor Baker the, uh, and state officials from Vermont, New Hampshire, uh, Massachusetts, and Rhode Island and Connecticut, uh, we held a forum about how all of federal and state partners could work together to advance the ball in consumer protection. And part of it was just making state officials aware of what we're doing and me learning what they are doing so that then we can push out a unified message. And uh, I, I look forward to any other ideas that you've got, but uh, I, both in word and deed, I really want to make sure that I'm uh, a presence on this issue here and across the country. Thank you. And thank you, by the way, since uh, uh, you're here, I w do want to thank the Trevor Project for the support on uh, 988, along with some of the other stakeholders. It, it, I can't tell you how much I've heard from folks who don't follow the nitty-gritty of what we do, who have followed this issue and have emailed or tweeted saying, hey, it's been a long time coming, and this could mean the difference between life and death uh, for those who are struggling with mental health issues. So We're really honored. appreciate the support. We're honored to do it for you. Okay. All right. Anyone else? Um, anyone online? Right. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, folks. Appreciate yeah, really good comments. to see you all. Yeah. Thanks. All right. Thank oh, thanks. I, ju I just want to say uh, a thank you to you for your leadership on this issue and other issues. And I just want to ask you if you're going to dance out. <laughs> <laughs> for anyone who was there last night, the chairman did a 
a dance out of his <laughs> remarks at the chairman's dinner last night. So just wondered if he was going to dance out for us. Well, I can say it seemed like a good idea at the time. Uh, <laughs> but at 46 with some shaky knees, uh, I don't know, I might have torn an ACL last night. So uh, I'll probably just have to hobble out at this point. So thank you nonetheless for the invitation. <laughs> Thanks again. All right. <laughs> Thank you very much. My pleasure. Right. Sure. Okay. Okay. All right. So, uh, so uh, next. Um, we're going we're gonna to move up to our 9.30 uh, update um, on 5G and what it means for consumers. And today we have a presenter, uh, Julia Snap, um, the Chief Office of Engineering and Technology, and with 45 years of experience, I understand. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Thank you. Let me uh, just get your card right there. Thanks so much. <laughs> it's, it's a cute up video. <laughs> I'm sorry. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, so, uh, you know, as I was preparing, because uh, there's a lot of information out there about 5G, uh, and I was focusing a bit on consumers, and I was uh, amused by some of the headlines. Uh, so, one of, one of them was. As 5G launches, consumers couldn't care less. <laughs> so I think we're done. No. Um, <laughs> I thought before talking about 5G, um, I'd say a little bit about what we've learned from our past experiences with the prior Gs. <laughs> um, so, and I've actually kind of lived every one of these. So when uh, the first generation uh, of phones, it was, uh, we didn't even know we needed numbers for G's. <laughs> so there was speculation about whether it would ever get to be more than a million people <laughs> with phones. Uh, and we all know what happened after that. When we got to 2G and we went from analog to digital, and you got to remember at the time, uh, paging was big. <laughs> I mean, you know, people wanted that page or something. We did. So when we got to 2G, there was short messaging <laughs> service. Anybody have a pager? <laughs> so when we got to 3G, we started to see the first glimpses of internet connectivity. Uh, and it really kind of set the stage for the game changer that came with 4G. Um, so. Why is 4G a game changer? Because it, pr it provided a more fulsome internet access, uh, a higher level of connectivity, and data rates, and so forth. So just look at what it has done in uh, whatever your perspective might be to different industries. And uh, the way we look at, we get books. <laughs> The way I make, we make our hotel reservations, newspapers and the media that we access, uh, retail, especially this time of year, everybody ordering <laughs> uh, gifts, uh, taxis, <laughs> and the, the massive change in, in that service with the introduction of uh, Lyft and Uber. Uh, hotels, restaurants, wearables. <laughs> Uh, it really has changed all of our lives. Went into a big box store <laughs> uh, a few days ago, and I was just struck that as I walked in, all of the wireless devices, and granted some of them are Wi-Fi, but what the beauty of the, the Gs is the integration between the Wi-Fi and Bluetooth connectivity, which provide a relatively short range and coverage in hotspots and so forth with the connection through your smartphone to uh, for wide area coverage. 
So as I walked into the store, you know, there were the, the wireless thermostats, <laughs> the video uh, doorbell, so to speak. So you could sit here in this room and if somebody's knocking at the door and you purchased one of these things, you could actually see who was there. Uh, and uh, the alarm systems <laughs> that, are, that are there. So as the technology has gotten more robust, we're seeing more innovation and more products that are being made available for consumers. So I think the one thing to take away from all of this is uh, what we should expect is the unexpected. <laughs> uh, you know, go going back again in, in 4G, nobody had any idea the iPhone was coming <laughs> or the apps marketplace and all the opportunities that that was going to uh, hold. So what about 5G? <laughs> uh, so I will, with, without the specifics, much greater speed uh, availability, much greater capacity for folks so that you're always getting a, a, a highly reliable service. And I think one of the things that's really a game changer is the reduced latency. What that means, um, it, you know, I, I've often related to people, it's what you experience when you see the lips moving on the screen and the voice is coming out a little later. <laughs> That's latency. <laughs> and the idea here is to get it down. Once you start to get down uh, well below 10 milliseconds, it, it allows for real-time interactions. And what real-time interactions does for you is suddenly you can actually control machines and equipment at a distance and so forth, and it opens up uh, App, the kinds of applications that need an almost immediate response. So um, let's talk about that a little bit. Um, it's much more than <coughs> cell phones. <laughs> uh, you know, folks focus on immediately what they're familiar with and, you know, what is it going to do for my phones. It's certainly going to do more for the phones. Always hard to predict. Uh, what new innovations we're going to see uh, from the phones because they're just getting better and more sophisticated every year. I, just a uh, little story about how it's affected at least my life. We, we have a little lunch group that sits together uh, each day and, and sometimes we get into debates over particular facts. <laughs> and uh, what tends to happen is everybody pulls out their cell phone to do a little research to make sure that they're the ones who are right. <laughs> so we're no longer arguing people. It's our phones that are arguing <laughs> with each other. Um, you really have the, all of the information of the world at your fingertips, and I think that's only going to get better with 5G. So uh, what's so different? It really opens up uh, connectivity for what people refer to as the verticals. Uh, when in transportation, where if we're going to have vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle technology that's reliable, uh, we have to get down to very low latencies for the interaction between the vehicles. So there's a lot of activity looking at versions of 5G for uh, transportation. I think when you look across the board in all of the sectors, healthcare, energy, and so forth, uh, it is going to open up new opportunities that we haven't seen before. Uh, I, I, Perhaps mistakenly, I sometimes think of consumers as at home. <laughs> but it really is we're consumers in all facets of our life. <laughs> and so we are already experiencing the changes that from what have come, and it's only, there's only more uh, to come. So um, here at the commission, we've been working hard to make sure that we are uh, providing all of the, uh, the access that 5G is going to need for spectrum, for dealing with things like infrastructure and so forth. And uh, it's, I, I would say, one of the top priorities at the commission and across government in trying to make sure that the U.S. leads on 5G. Uh, one of the things that strikes me is also, uh, this is sometimes not well understood, it's critical for all our factories. <laughs> it is critical for our economy. The factories of today are automated. They have to change things on the fly <laughs> sometimes. Uh, this technology could enable that as well. Um, just a couple of myths, and then I'll open it up for questions. Uh, so 5G is not a single frequency band. <laughs> 
So when you hear folks say, oh, it's all millimeter wave band, these high frequencies, and then you see the ad, somebody says it's 5G, and you think, oh, it's those millimeter wave bands, it's going to be multiple frequency bands. The, the carriers all have assets, spectrum assets, in different parts of the spectrum. Likely you'll use the higher ranges for high capacity at, at short distances. The mid-range, which is what we're working hard on right now, uh, to make more spectrum available is a kind of a sweet spot because it's a good blend of coverage and capacity. The lower bands are uh, great for coverage at distances, not as much total bandwidth. If you look at any one in isolation, I would venture to say that there is not one band that is the total solution. It's the combination of all these things together that really creates the power that you're going to need for 5G. Um, so I'll stop there and I'd be happy to, uh, one, one more point. We have a tendency, I think, nowadays to, you know, commission does the rulemaking and think, gee, it's all there. It's all, <laughs> it's going to happen overnight. It takes time to deploy systems. <laughs> uh, what you're seeing is kind of the early introductions so far. It will take time to build out the systems. Uh, so, uh, it, you know, I would reserve judgments whatever judgments you have about 5G and what it's going to do uh, over, over time. So I'd be happy to take questions. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Eric Cook, thank you for your presentation. Sure. Can you comment on where we are relative to other nations on 5G deployment? A lot being written about that too. Yep. So, uh, okay, uh, uh, so one of these are my personal thoughts <coughs> as well. Um, we had our, our Technological Advi Advisory Council uh, just last week and did a presentation on 5G and the Internet of Things, and there's some terrific information in there about comparing us to where we are in the rest of the world. Uh, China, kind of led through the government, has been heavily investing in base stations and so forth. I think we're, uh, uh, we're still in the lead. <laughs> uh, some might debate that, but I. I think what the real strength is of the United States is our innovation and what you do with it. <laughs> it's not just having the ability to have a data rate. <laughs> it's the creativity where I think the United States has uh, far outstretched everybody else in the world. <laughs> and I have every <laughs> expectation that's going to continue to happen. Hi, Matt Gerst with CTIA. Um, so two comments. One, uh, as we all heard, we all know you're retiring, and so I just want to again say thank you for your decades of service oh, and um, leadership. Here. Uh, second uh, comment is, you know, as, we, as we're moving into this 5G world, uh, we continue to hear about challenges at the local level, and that this being the Consumer Advisory Committee of local um, folks at the local level kind of understanding the value of 5G, understanding you know why we need to have the right policies in place to make 5G happen. Um, what are some of the things that you, how do you think we can address those? You know, by educating the public about what the value and benefits of 5G are. Yeah, and, and uh, we just allude to to is I know sometimes there's questions about the RF exposure compliance and so forth. And last week the commission had a, released an order, which basically affirmed the standards that we have in place. And part of the uh, tasking from the commission in there was to update our information for consumers and the public to, to help them understand the technology because I know there's a lot of speculation and not completely understanding what, what that's all about. Uh, the, the, the proper standards to protect people are in place. <laughs> uh, and I think there's uh, a bit of work we have to do to, on, on the consumer outreach side to help people understand and reassure them that things are fine. Uh, any other questions? And anyone on the phone? Steve. Hi, this is Christina. Uh, Julie, uh, your uh, pending retirement is going to leave quite a uh, quite a gap for us here at the commission, and I'm, I know we're all sorry to see you, see you depart. 
But I wanted to leverage your expertise and ask a question about um, what are the things you see coming down the, down the line, down the pike, that uh, we need to watch out for or keep an eye out for, uh, things that are exciting or new and novel that uh, are really um, uh, uh, things that we can um, be uh, keeping an eye out for. Thanks. How much time do we have now? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, at risk of leaving anybody out, uh, and, and actually it's a preview because I'm, I'm doing a session a little later on today about the very same topic. Uh, so just off the cuff, uh, and, and, and feeding off what I said before about things happening and then we think there's a commission rulemaking that's finished and we're all done. Uh, I think across every sector you're seeing uh, new services and technologies that are being introduced. So uh, in, in no particular order, I think you're going to see the first ATSC 3.0 television sets introduced probably next year. Uh, I expect you'll hear more about from the Consumer Electronics Show. Uh, how that rolls out and exactly what uh, additional services it plays for consumers. Uh, there's folks with some terrific ideas and we'll see if they take hold. Uh, on the satellite front, uh, there's uh, are, are going to be deployed massive networks of satellites for internet connectivity <laughs> and for connectivity to for the internet of things. Um, I was in a meeting not too long ago in, uh, you know, having been at this for a while, I think of a satellite as a giant thing, you know. Uh, in, the folks who were there said, you don't want to see my satellite? I said, you know, sure. So it's in this box. <laughs> so these are the CubeSats that are small, and they can be launched you know, pretty economically. We've got students uh, with terrific experiments that are going up uh, in our satellite. So there's a lot happening on the satellite front. We've talked about 5G. I think some of the things we're also in that RF exposure either we made some proposals about wireless power transfer uh, because we've got all these devices particularly important for uh, sensors that would be deployed for the Internet of Things and not having to go out and change batteries in them every few years. So that's a technology that's still unfolding. Uh, the uh, unmanned aerial systems and we're, you know, we're wrestling a little bit with some of the spectrum issues, but the benefits of it are clear for things like, uh, you, you'll hear about the package delivering and so forth, and you certainly have the, uh, the hobbyist sort of things, but you have an emergency out in an area, it's a fast way to get medication to that site, to inspect the bridges, where we used to have to have somebody go, go there and uh, to be able to, to actually take an HD camera and get under there. Uh, tower inspections, on and on. So that's another exciting technology. Uh, I think longer term, you're gonna see more stuff on the optical side, uh, just because, it, you know, if you can, the, what, what's clever about some of the things that are happening optically is the, the, the question was, well, I can have massive bandwidth with an optical connection, but if something gets in the way, it disconnects. So how do I deal with this? Uh, if you build it as a network, and if one thing doesn't get through, others do, and so some of that technology has kind of been working into its way on the satellite side. Uh, so I'm sure I'm leaving things out, but that's a, unlicensed is going gangbusters, and Wi-Fi, uh, I would venture to say that we accidentally created the uh, one technology you can use just about anywhere in the world with your same device. <laughs> uh, it just caught to, took hold for all of the efforts that go on. Uh, it's a desirable outcome to harmonize spectrum around the world. That's not always so easy because of the existing incumbencies and so forth. Uh, so uh, the uh, Wi-Fi is going gangbusters as is Bluetooth. So I'll stop there. That's that should be enough for. <laughs> and and I, I do think you know not uh, you know being mindful of all of the uh, as the technologies come out security trying to build that in from the start uh, privacy uh, for consumers 
uh, all those things have to be accounted for too. Okay. Yep. Good. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was, that was so interesting. So I really do appreciate that. Um, so I think we're ready to go. All right, so, so now we're gonna um, um, go through uh, <coughs> A series of presentations from the government, uh, from the Consumer and Government Affairs Bureau, um, and starting us off, then uh, we'll have uh, Patrick Weber. Oh, hey, <laughs> can see. Good morning, everyone, um, and welcome to the winter meeting of the Consumer Advisory Committee. Um, and I think for those of us who live in D.C., um, winter may have finally arrived for us. A lot of us woke up this morning to some snow on our cars, snow on our lawns, snow on our rooftops. So I think winter's finally here. Um, and thank you again for, for being here with us this morning. Um, you're wrapping up your 2019 work in some busy fashion today. You have a very full agenda. And I'll highlight just a few of those things. Uh, first of all, you know, we kicked off with Julie Knapp, who's been with the commission for 45 years. Um, He's just been a, a great, a wonderful person to work with. Um, I've worked with him myself for about 15 of those years. And um, just a really pleasant person, a person who can put um, very complicated topics, I think, as we know, into you know, user-friendly, consumer-friendly words um, and expressions. And it's very helpful for us, especially those of us who are technically challenged, um, <laughs> who are not engineers. And, and, uh, and he's, he's been a great uh, person. I know he's leaving behind a good legacy here. Uh, lots of folks that work with Julie in the Office of Engineering and Technology will carry on his legacy, but we all wish him well, um, and we will all miss him uh, very much. Um, so, you know, it was great to hear from Julie about what's coming up in 5G, uh, what's coming down the pike. Um, I like to pick his brain sometimes myself about, I keep needling him about when are, when are um, self-driving cars going to get here, you know? The drivers <laughs> in D.C. are not, not as good as these uh, computers could be, I think, at some point. And he's like, it's going to be a while. He keeps, you know, toning me down a little bit, but I'm very excited about that possibility because um, it seems like some people don't want to drive um, and they'd rather be doing other things and a lot of times they are doing other things while they're, they're driving. Yeah. Um, so after our briefing, um, you'll hear from Jesse Jackson. Um, I'm sorry, first you'll hear from the Office of Legislative Affairs um, regarding some pending legislation. Uh, the Trace Act is one of them. We've all um, heard some, some things about that. So you'll get an update from our Office of Legislative Affairs about that as well as some other um, legislation involving consumer-related topics. Um, and then you'll hear from Jesse Jackman, who's a designated federal officer of a, the Precision Connectivity Agriculture, sorry, the Precision Agriculture Con Connectivity Task Force. Um, they just kicked off recently. So he'll provide a description of what precision ag agriculture is, uh, its value to consumers, and an overview of the task force mission. And then the Wireline Competition Bureau will give you an overview <coughs> of the FCC's proposed three-year, $100 million connected care telehealth pilot program. After that, Christy Thompson, uh, the chief of our telecommunications consumer division in the Enforcement Bureau, will give you an update on consumer, um, current consumer scams and other related um, EV activities. And then finally this afternoon, the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau will cover the FCC's recent NPRM proposing some changes to our universal licensing system, ULS, um, including that all filings be made electronically. And I also look forward to the recommendation that you will be considering this afternoon regarding consumer education surrounding the implementa implementation of shaken and stir, caller ID authentication. I certainly appreciate all the hard work you've done thus far and all the hard work yet to come. We appreciate uh, the, CAC, uh, the CAC members, the CAC members' time, and their CAC, the CAC members' input. It really matters as we work together to protect consumers. Um, so as we've done in, in prior CAC meetings, we will um, introduce um, some of the deputies, deputy um, bureau chiefs and our associate bureau chief um, to give you an overview of their areas of responsibility, kind of what's been going on lately um, in those areas. So we'll start it off with Mark Stone, who is uh, the deputy bureau chief overseeing our consumer policy division. Good morning. Good morning. 
Um, I would say on the topic of self-driving cars, having a daughter who just got a driver's license. <laughs> the idea of self-driving cars sounds great. On the other hand, riding a motorcycle myself, I'm curious whether those same sort of ideas apply to motorcycles, whether that's even a possibility. So look forward to that. <clears throat> Good morning. Since our uh, since your last meeting in September, my area of CGB has been busy on robocalls, just as you have. Uh, as you know, the commission in June <coughs> made clear that voice providers can block calls that are likely to be illegal based on the reasonable analytics. They do that before those sort of calls can ever reach consumer phones, and they can now do it by default, giving consumers the ability to opt out if they decide that they don't want that type of blocking. In that same action, the commission asked if it should allow providers, voice service providers, to block calls on other grounds, including incorporation of caller ID authentication metrics into their analysis. That proceeding, as you might imagine, has garnered a considerable record, and we're working through those issues now and look forward to the next steps. Now, that call blocking work, of course, focuses on stopping um, illegal calls before they ever reach consumer phones. If they do reach consumer phones, we have the Telephone Consumer Protection Act, or TCPA, which we administer to address those types of calls and faxes. So we continue to work through really big picture TCPA issues um, that apply to virtually all callers. Um, but we also now have turned our attention to individual petitions that often tee up um, more discreet, individualized questions. Um, and over the last week, our Bureau has released two such decisions, one related to the names that businesses may use when they leave pre-recorded messages on consumer phones. That name's particularly important because it lets the called party, the called consumer, understand who's called and lets them know who to contact if they want to make a do not call request or revoke previous consent to receive that call. Our second decision related to faxes and how the TCPA's fax restrictions apply to modern technologies that don't resemble the old fax machines. So those are just two things that we've done recently, and uh, we know there's a number of other pending petitions before us, and we know that consumers and callers and faxers alike are looking forward to, to our guidance on that, so we're, we're working on that. We also continue our work on the reassigned numbers database. You may recall that the North American Numbering Council is advising us on the details of that database, um, and we look forward to getting their recommendations on it, and then we, along with our colleagues and some of the other bureaus, will be putting that out for public comment. So something for you all to keep your eye on. So that's it. That's the thumbnail from, from where I'm at in CGB, and I'll hand it over to my colleague. Thank you. So uh, next we have uh, Barbara Epson, uh, Espen, excuse me. Morning. Um, Good morning. <laughs> Mark is modest. If there's one word that people associate with our bureaus, it's robocalls. And <laughs> that is the man. So um, I think, as you know, it, by this time, uh, I oversee the governmental affairs portion of the bureau's work, the Office of Intergovernmental Affairs, and the Office of Native Affairs and Policy. So this past quarter has been extremely busy for um, both of my groups. Uh, ONAP, in conjunction with other FCC bureaus and offices, has continued the Commission's outreach to tribes and tribal organizations, including holding tribal workshops in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and in Blue Lake, California. If you don't know where Blue Lake is, it's in Humboldt County. Um, rather remote little reservation there. And the Commission uses these workshops to provide presentations on a broad range of important agency programs and policies that support the deployment of communications infrastructure and services in Indian country. Recent and upcoming events have primarily focused on the recently created Rural Tribal Priority Window for new licenses in the 2.5 gigahertz band, which has the potential to significantly increase the deployment and adoption of modern communication services on unserved and underserved tribal lands. ONAP, <coughs> together with its colleagues in the wireline and wireless bureaus, 
made several presentations at a September National Tribal Broadband Summit, which is sponsored by the Departments of the Interior and Education and the Institute for Museum and Library Science Services here in DC. Chairman Pai delivered keynote remarks at this event as well. ONAP staff also participated in and presented at external events held by external tribal organizations, including the Internet Society's Indigenous Connectivity Webinar in Hilo, Hawaii. Actually, Patrick Weber uh, flew the flag for the Bureau at that event self-sacrifice that he made. <laughs> Tribal Net Conference in Nashville, Tennessee. And joint uh, ONAP and Wireless Bureau outreach efforts surrounding 2.5 gigahertz have included various workshops and tribal events, including addressing the FCC's Intergovernmental Advisory Committee and participating in a number of uh, intertribal organization events, including the Affiliated Tribes of Northwest Indians Annual Convention, Alaska Federation and Natives Corporation, National Congress of the American Indian, Alaska Telecom Association Tech Showcase, uh, our FCC Native Nations Communications Task Force meeting, I, we a 2.5 gigahertz workshop on tribal lands in Gallup, New Mexico, National Tribal GIS Conference, Albuquerque, and a Bureau of Indian Affairs Tribal Providers Conference in Anchorage, Alaska. We're definitely the traveling group. But that's not all. <laughs> In terms of policy work, ONAP staff prepared and issued a public notice seeking comment on the effectiveness of the Commission's tribal engagement guidance, which seeks to facilitate dialogue between tribes and carriers <coughs> receiving high-cost USF support for service on tribal lands. Uh, ONAP also oversees the work of the Native Nations Communications Task Force task force met here in November, its uh, second in-person meeting of the year. And at that time, the members finalized and adopted their first report to the commission, which identifies obstacles to greater broadband deployment and adoption on tribal <laughs> lands and offers some potential solutions. Task force has now turned to its second task, which was to evaluate the effectiveness of the Commission's tribal engagement guidance, offer us recommendations, best practices. IGA has also been quite busy uh, in the past few months, uh, attending and participating in and presenting at a variety of um, national, state, and local government organization meetings. Uh, I'll read the acronyms. If you don't know what one is, stop me. Otherwise, it'll take a very long time. There's NITOA, NASIO, NARUC, NISUCA, NLC, NAG, and NCSL. That really covers the waterfront mm -hmm. on national, state, and local organizations. And like ONAP, IGA oversees the administration of the uh, Intergovernmental Advisory Committee, the IAC. The IAC had its final meeting of its term here in September, and it adopted four reports uh, making recommendations to the Commission <coughs> on how to identify state, local, and tribal regulatory barriers and incentives to telemedicine best practices to ensure that non-English speaking communities receive emergency alerts, best practices to fine tune state, local, and tribal coordination for disaster preparation, response, and restoration efforts, best practices for communications between state emergency managers and EAS state emergency communications committees, to ensure that EAS procedures, including the initiation and cancellation of actual alerts and tests, are mutually understood. And my final message is that the Commission has reauthorized the Intergovernmental Advisory Committee for another two-year term, 
we are currently actively seeking nominations from state, local, and tribal governments to serve on this committee. And I, I encourage you to go out into your um, constituent worlds and um, encourage good public servants to apply to work on our advisory committee. So, in question. Okay. Oh, we can get questions too at the end after we sure. go through all the speakers. So, thank you, Barbara. Thank you. Appreciate that. So, uh, Diane Burstein, I, I guess. Um, you're up. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, we can we can get questions too at the end of all this. Uh... Great. Thank you, Diane. Sure. Good morning. Uh, I'm Diane Burstein, and I am Deputy Bureau Chief of CGB overseeing the Disability Rights Office, and I, I recognize many of you from that role. I'm happy to be here today to highlight some of the key uh, things that the Disability Rights Office has been working on since your last meeting in September. Um, we've taken several steps to advance the foundation of the Telecommunications Relay Services, or TRS, which provides services for individuals with hearing or speech disabilities so they can engage in communications in a manner functionally equivalent to an individual who does not have a hearing or speech disability. So uh, in general, on so on September 18th, the FCC adopted an item to modernize the TRS rules by updating the Commission's definition of TRS to match the definition in the 21st Century Communications and Accessibility Act of 2010, the CVAA, and issued a further notice of proposed rulemaking looking to eliminate some outdated rules relating to equal access and multiple billing options requirements in light of changes in the marketplace. Uh, just a few weeks ago, in November, uh, the Commission adopted a report in order to expand the TRS fund contribution base for support of IPCTS, uh, Internet Protocol Caption Telephone Service, lots of acronyms in this area. Uh, as you may know, IPCTS is a form of TRS that permits a person who can speak but is difficult to hearing over the phone to use a phone and an IP-enabled device via the internet to simultaneously listen to the other party and read captions of what the party is saying. Prior to the ruling, IPCTS was funded based only on interstate telecommunications revenues. In this recent order, the Commission provides that TRS fund contributions to support IPCTS will be calculated based on the total interstate and intrastate end user revenues of each telecommunications carrier and VoIP service provider. This puts the fund for IPCTS on a solid footing, and the new funding approach will start with the 2020 <coughs> 21 TRS fund year. Also in the IPCTS area, the FCC is examining comments filed earlier this year on whether to grant applications from certain providers to begin offering IPCTS solely using automatic speech recognition, ASR technology. Currently, IPCTS is typically provided through a combination of ASR and a person sitting in the middle of the call to revoice the conversation the applications are seeking to provide AS, to provide IPCTS using ASR only. Um, on, with respect to the video relay service, on October 30th, CGB released an order extending the VRS at-home call handling pilot program through April 30th of next year or the effective date of an FCC decision on its notice of proposed rulemaking proposing to make this pilot program permanent. Uh, the pilot program permits certified VRS providers to use sign language interpreters working from home workstations so long as certain rules are followed to safeguard service quality, call confidentiality, and to prevent waste, fraud, and abuse. Uh, in October, the Commission also adopted a notice of proposed rulemaking to update its suspension and debarment rules 
and apply these rules to TRS programs and the National Deafblind Equipment Distribution Program. Specifically, the notice proposes to adopt new rules consistent with OMB's guidance for government-wide debarment and suspension to keep fraudsters uh, uh, away from programs like this. And uh, comments are being, uh, the comment date for that has not yet been issued. Uh, DRO's also been active on areas related to the accessibility of video programming. In October, the FCC released its second report to Congress on video description as required by the CVAA. The CVAA was designed to help ensure that individuals with disabilities can fully engage in communication services and equipment and better access video programming. The October report examines various aspects of video description, including the amount and types of described video programming, consumer usage and benefits, the costs of creating described video programming, and the need for additional described programming. DRO in this area is also reviewing comments that were filed this fall relating to a petition submitted by representatives of the disability community on caption quality issues, including the use of ASR for captioning live programming. Finally, uh, the Disability Advisory Committee is scheduled to meet in February of next year, where we'll be taking up additional issues of interest to consumers. These are uh, the key highlights, and uh, thanks for your time this morning. Okay, um, and um, uh, we have uh, uh, one more here for uh, Ed. There he is. Good to see you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. So I want to start by echoing um, some of the thank yous that you've heard earlier today. Uh, we appreciate the time you give to this committee and the FCC as well as the pace that you have been working um, to provide us with useful recommendations on some important consumer protection issues. Um, and I too look forward to your recommendation later, or upcoming later today on caller ID authentication and shaken and stir education. A Couple quick highlights, so as you probably know by now, I, I work with our complaints division here, our web and print publishing, or as I like to call them, education division and our, our outreach division at the commission. Um, our complaints division recently uh, signed a new call center contract that's now been awarded, so Gettysburg is not going anywhere. Uh, there will still be people there taking phone calls directly from consumers and helping them uh, navigate FCC issues. Um, we're also about to hit the five-year anniversary of our online consumer complaint center later this month. Uh, it actually sort of soft launched on Halloween a little over five years ago and it fully launched, uh, I believe, December 20 something, uh, five years ago. Um, James Brown, who you've heard from many times, is, is the sort of lead in keeping that together um, and we appreciate his efforts. Um, and many CAC members provided valuable input as that program was developed five years ago. Um, you know, Candidly, I was one of the CAC members, so that's a little bit of a pat on my own back at the time, but many of the rest of you provided input as well, too. Um, and five years is a milestone worth noting, and we do have some things in the works for the coming months, so stay tuned on that front. Um, on the education front, you heard from our expert on 5G already this morning, sure. and you've probably seen the commercials. Uh, and research is showing that consumers are a little bit confused about 5G. As Julie mentioned, we can help clear up that confusion. As a start, we'll be launching a 5G consumer FAQ soon. It will be part of a package of content designed to highlight the evolution of wireless communications. In addition to the online FAQ, we plan to do a tip card and develop some outreach materials around understanding what are the Gs. Uh, other recent posts that we've done, just in time for holiday travel, we did a consumer alert about juice jacking. Um, it doesn't involve steroids at all. Uh, it involves using public charging ports. So you, you see the little USB things in the airport and other places, you stick it in. Um, 
scammers being an innovative lot have figured out how to load malware into those, how to get information off your devices or even put programs onto your devices simply by you pl plugging in and charging. Um, our top tip on that is just carry the the wall outlet thing, most of them are pretty small and plug it into a wall outlet and you should be fine. Um, there are other innovative products that can also help protect you. Some have very intriguing names. I encourage you to look into that on your own. Um, <laughs> we did a recent post on open enrollment season scams. So phone calls are up. Umail data showing that healthcare related calls was one of the top, was the top issue for their October report. Um, and we've got some, some great consumer education around some of the things that uh, scammers are trying when it comes to open <laughs> enrollment issues. We have more scam posts to come and we're looking to do more with data-driven content, including some data visualizations uh, that might highlight some of the scam information we're seeing. Earlier this fall, we released our second in-house animated video and it was on emergency communications. Um, it features a great character called Mo. I encourage all of you to check it out. Uh, but goes through the same tips that we include in our audio PSAs and on our uh, consumer education portal, fcc.gov slash emergency. Uh, things like charging your device when you know a storm is coming, making sure that you have emergency contacts identified in your phone, non-emergency numbers so you can call the local sheriff instead of 911, depending on the situation and, and what the need that you have is. Uh, we did provide Spanish translation support for outage reports during the California wildfires and Tropical Storm Dorian earlier this year. Um, a fun fact, uh, our Consumer Guides web page monthly growth has, is up 5% from June to November. So we're happy that we're getting increased traffic, more people are coming and, and checking out the great materials we have. Along those lines, uh, earlier I'm sorry, in November, we launched uh, a downloadables page. So you can now download PDF versions of all our tip cards and use them to support your efforts. As I like to say, you've already paid for them through your tax dollars. So they're, you're welcome to grab them, you're welcome to use the tips, you're welcome to take the cards and, and personalize them in, in a way that, you, that makes sense for you. Um, but they're all now up there, can be downloaded, and please make use of them. Uh, we recently re redesigned our outreach web page. So if you go to fcc.gov slash outreach, um, you can see that new fresh look and, and you know, kind of poke around and, and find some good materials there. Last time we were together, we talked about how we were working to get Hmong versions of a lot of our content. Uh, we now have that available. Um, we were working with our supermarket chain partner in California to get those distributed. We've sent it to partners in Minnesota and other parts of the country where there are pockets of, of Hmong and, and Bowden just reminded me that we owe Milwaukee some as well because there's some, there's some Hmong population in that part of the, the country also. Um, as the chairman mentioned earlier, partnerships are important for our robocall work and also all of our outreach and education work. Um, we launched monthly partner calls in September and those have quickly transition, transitioned to a webinar format. Our December webinar was yesterday and included a guest presenter from the National Cybersecurity Alliance's Stop, Think, Connect initiative with a focus on holiday consumer protection tips. Last month, we were guests on an FTC Facebook Live that focused on military and veteran consumer topics. Uh, we have a few guides that are focused on if you're being deployed overseas, you know, what can you do with your cell phone contract, things like that. We're working with USAC to do some outreach and education around the national verifier that's rolling out across the country. Um, We've done some national presentations at NAX conference, which is the, our partner for the supermarket program. We exhibited at the Wisconsin State Broadcasters Association conference, the Association of Late Deaf and Adults conference, uh, presented at FOSI's conference um, just a couple weeks ago here in DC, uh, did a grand opening of a new Operation Hope Center in Baltimore, and they're, they're a great partner for us too in getting the word out about robocalls and other consumer issues. We've also done a lot of good local events. We were able to participate in the HUD Connect at Home sub Summit, um, and we're really excited about the potential partnership there, because what we found is that the sort of housing leaders and the, the 
admin structure in HUD facilities is a really great consumer touch point. They're who the people living in those buildings go to with questions and with problems. So getting tip cards, getting information in those offices is a great way to inform a group that may not always hear from you know, w the content that we've got out there. Uh, rural tours, as you know, I like to tell you about when we go places. Um, so in September, we were in Kansas and Nebraska, and as the chairman mentioned, we were able to do an event with the chairman in Nebraska. Uh, we did 17 public meetings, we did nine drop-offs, got some great local media coverage, covered hundreds of miles, tried something called a Runyon, which is a uh, fast food place in Nebraska. Um, in both states, we were able to have events with representatives from the state AG off J state attorney general's office participating, and a big thank you to AARP for helping us to plan and coordinate the consumer-facing event that we did with the chairman in Fremont, Fremont Nebraska. Um, great turnout, really good event. Uh, really nice panel discussion in addition to some great remarks. Um, upcoming rural tours. So we are actively planning Arizona and New Mexico in January 2020. Uh, so that's coming up quickly. Um, the one after that will be Arkansas and Louisiana in March. So if you have contacts, if you have members or partners in those states, please let us know. We'd be happy to work with you on a joint event. Um, Another thing that falls into our outreach category or actually is our 504 compliance officer and the interpreters. Um, so we're really, I want to just say thank you to everybody who provided comments in the recent 504 um, proceeding or, uh, you know, we sort of put out a, a refresh of the, right, and got some feedback on what we're doing well and what we're not doing well. Um, Really appreciated the, the good feedback there and the kind remarks that were said about the great interpreter staff that we have here at the FCC. Uh, coming up next, uh, we are launching soon and working towards getting together public facing outreach toolkits. So the concept here is that any librarian, any you know, local senior center or other community serving institution could come to the FCC website and download everything they would need to do an, a presentation in their building to their audience on things like robocalls, rescanning your television for the repack, or any other relevant consumer issue. So hopefully those are gonna be up and ready in the spring, that's our goal, um, and I'll probably be back here to tell you about it when, when it's there. Uh, also, keep an eye on our social media platforms. We're planning some holiday-themed consumer education posts. Mo from the emergency communications video may make an appearance in some of those. Uh, and stay in touch, if you, and if you're not already in touch, please reach out. Um, if you have events we can support, let us know. Happy to participate, and if you have ideas about education topics, we're always willing to, to hear those and to work with you, so thank you. Well, thanks, Ed. Um, uh, so, so we had a good update on, on uh, the issues of outreach and scamming and complaints, and we heard from the other speakers uh, various uh, topics of disability and, and tribal issues and so on. So uh, does anyone have any questions here uh, before we break um, regarding um, what we've just heard from from the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau before they leave? So yeah, please, Deborah. Yeah, Debbie Berlin, uh, National Consumers League. I have a question for Ed. Uh, I was just wondering when you were talking about the scams and uh, work on that, I was wondering if you coordinate with the FTC that who would also have an interest in some of these same campaigns and issues. So we do, and um, I think, you know, the spoofing work that we did over the past year was, was heavily coordinated with them. Um, the Facebook Live we, that we did on military and veterans issues is another example where there's coordination. Uh, we do work with our colleagues over there. We have good dialogue about the things uh, that we're working on, that they're working on. Um, I don't, we don't fully sort of like say, you're gonna do this on Wednesday and we're gonna do this on Thursday kind of thing, but there is a good back and forth. And I think, like you said, we have joint goals when it comes to scam and fraud education on, on protecting consumers. All right, any other questions? Um, anyone here from the Bureau? Please, Johnny. 
Ed, when you uh, say consumers are confused about 5G rollout, I'm, I'm, I'm curious what kind of things they are confused about. So what we've seen in, in some recent research is that, you know, I think that there's a little bit of a misunderstanding about where we're at in the deployment cycle. So one thing that I saw in an article recently is that a lot of consumers think that the latest version of an Apple product already has 5G built into it. Like that's just an assumption that's being made. Um, so, you know, it's, you see the commercials, you kind of see the products coming out there, and I think that there's maybe a misunderstanding about how ubiquitous it currently is. Um, and also, our focus is really to, to make sure that consumers have relevant information so that they can make you know, informed purchasing decisions so that when they're out there considering, you know, do I upgrade now, do I wait a few months to upgrade, um, they know what it is. So for example, one of the things in our frequently asked questions guide is, you know, my home Wi-Fi router says 5G in the title, does that mean I already have 5G, right? So it's clearing up things like that. It's a diff that's a different type of technology, it's not the same as the cellular 5G that, that we've been talking about this morning. So just making sure that there's a good consumer baseline of knowledge. Um, it's not meant to be anywhere near as technical as the, as the information Julie provided to you today. We're not gonna talk about which waves travel further than others and, and <laughs> things like that. Um, that's not really a consumer touch point, but there, there does seem to be some. <coughs> out there. All right, uh, last chance. Any other questions here or on the phone uh, for anyone here at the Bureau? Okay, so thank you. Thanks to all of you, and we'll take, we're gonna take a, a short break, so let's try to get back here in, you know, maybe 10.35. So let's make a quick break. Thank you. Okay, uh, we're gonna start back up here in, in just a couple seconds. Um, uh, we have a, uh, a video with, uh, from Commissioner O'Reilly, so what we're going to do is we're just going to take a moment and uh, go through and, and hear the message that he's uh, <coughs> given here for the, uh, the CAC today. All right, so let's get that moving. All right, so here's the video. Good morning, and welcome back to the hardworking members of the Consumer Advisory Committee. I apologize for not being able to address you personally, but I have a prior speaking engagement that has kept me from meeting with you in person today. First of all, let me extend my thanks to the members of the CAC. I have said this before, but sincerely, thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules and spending time away from your families to serve this important function. The Commission relies on public input to make the most informed decisions possible, and the CAC serves to channel this critically important views and sentiment of American consumers on key policy matters. I truly value your contributions to the FCC's process, even if I may not always agree on each and every substantive suggestion or recommendation. In terms of the work facing the CAC right now, the agenda for today's meeting wasn't finalized at the time of this taping but I suspect it involves a healthy dose of robocalls and discussions of 5G, telehealth, and future projects for the CAC. The varied membership of the CAC will have a world of views on these issues and others. I hope you keep two thoughts in mind as you go about your work today and until we can next meet in person. First, I consider one of your priorities to be looking out for the paying public. There are tons of groups and advocates all looking to spend more USF monies or mandate this or that initiative. Yet no one is designated to look out for the average Americans, the ones struggling to get by in the improving but ever complex economy. These are the people working hard to feed their families and keep their communications service bills paid and up to date. They do not have high powered lobbyists advocating on their behalf. Every extra dollar taken from their household budget means something else has to give. And every new burden imposed on the communications industry is passed onto these consumers in one form or another through higher costs, fewer services, decreased access, and the like. As you consider the important commission matters before you, please keep this in front of your mind. You are charged with advising the commission on behalf of the American consumer. Second, 
please try to recognize the unintended consequences of government intervention and why FCC action needs to be narrowly tailored to address the immediate problems that have been identified. Take, for instance, robocalls. Many robocalls are beneficial to American consumers and should not be halted or disrupted just because bad actors are abusing the network. Absolutely, we must go after the perpetrators of criminal activity and those carrying out illegal consumer practices. But no one should want to block pharmacy notifications, doctor test results, school closings, power disruptions, and so many other good legal robocalls as a result of overly broad policy changes. You see this exact point addressed in new legislation on the Hill, and it's why I've pushed so hard to ensure that the Commission is mindful of the far-reaching impact of its actions, both positive and negative. The CAC must do the same. If you keep these two principles in mind, look out for the little guy and be mindful of the reach of Commission actions, you would do great service to American consumers. Thank you so very much for your attentiveness, and I wish you well for the rest of the day. Okay, so um, now with that, um, we're going to, I guess, back by po popular demand. Uh, you, were just, you just did this last time. Uh, but everyone was so interested in the topic, we thought we should do this again and get an update on the pending legislation. So uh, today we have a presenter is, again, Lori Moorbeer. Uh, she's the chief of staff for, and senior attorney advisor for the Office of Legislative Affairs. So Lori. Let me just turn that over to you. Great. Um, it's so great to be back with you. Um, I guess a long time ago, one of my first bosses, I think he's a member of the committee, Barry Umansky, said something to me once, like, no good deed goes unpunished. <laughs> so um, I don't think Barry's here today, though, unfortunately. Um, he's on the phone. He's on, oh. Yeah, he's online. See, there you go. Um, <laughs> but I'm really glad to be here. Um, good morning. Uh, uh, I do want to correct the record um, from Ed's presentation. Obviously, no one is from Nebraska like me. But it is not a runyon, it is a runza. A runza. runza. It's a runza. Um, but y'all should go to Nebraska and try one because they're very, very good. Um, but anyway, um, moving on. So I, again, it's great to be back, and I actually have updates to give you. So um, Congress has been um, moving along steadily, um, slowly but steadily, on certain aspects of the things that I updated you on um, in September. Um, the, the main one being, of course, um, the, the robocall bill. Um, and so this is just kind of the, the, the slide that I had that in September that kind of said this is what the Senate bill says, this is what the House bill says. Um, just a quick recap. Um, they weren't too far off. Um, the Senate bill uh, wanted to implement shake and stir specifically, whereas the House bill um, originally was silent on the type of um, technology. Um, they both created an inter interagency working group. They both increased forfeitures for intentional violations. They both increased statute of limitations for intentional robocall violations, but they did it in a different way. Um, from that point on in the, in the bills, they differed. So there was different things between the two. Um, I won't run through them specifically because neither one of these bills really matters anymore because we have a compromise bill. So um, the staff um, had worked through um, the different language and they came up with a compromise bill. Um, that bill passed last week in the House um, overwhelmingly, um, 417 to 3. It was, uh, it was a, a vote that they wanted to take just to show how much support there is for this bill. Um, so the major provision, again, this is, this is not everything that's contained in the bill. This is my caveat. Um, these are just some of the things um, uh, that, that are there. If you really want to know, you should read the bill yourself. It's only 44 pages long. Um, <laughs> wait till we get to the House one. I'll tell you all about that one. That one's a little bit longer. Um, but again, it generally adopts the Senate language on stir shaken. So it decided to go. They decided to go specifically with that particular technology. Part of the Senate language was that um, the commission is tasked with. Um, evaluating that every three years and reporting to Congress. Um, so if there's changes or things that need to be done differently, um, there is a mechanism for them to tell Congress. Um, retains the language that creates the interagency working group. So that was similar, in that was the same in both, and so they kept that in there. 
Um, it adopts the Senate language to increase forfeitures um, for intentional violations. Um, and it removes the statutory citation requirement. So currently, um, it has to, a citation has to be given before you can enforce, um, but they remove that for intentional um, robocall violations. Um, it adopts the Senate language to retain the statute of limitations um, as opposed to the House language, which was a little bit more broad. So um, it retains the statute of limitations for one year for general violations, but if it's a intentional robocall violation, it has a four-year statute of limitations. Now this is something that's originally the House bill had three years, and now we have a four-year, um, potentially a four-year statute of limitations for intentional robocall violations. Um, it also adopted the House language to um, to increase the statute of limitation for truth and color ID violations from two years to four years. Um, retains the House language on an annual report to Congress on enforcement, um, but a key provision of that, it does not, the language does not allow the FCC to collect additional information from providers when it has to make that report. Um, retains the House language to require an annual robo robocall report to Congress on privately led efforts to, to trace back the origin of unlawful robocalls maintains the House language that requires the FCC to establish a process to streamline voluntary information sharing with the FCC, retains the House language that requires the FCC to take final action within one year um, of enactment on free robocall blocking services, retains the House language that requires the FCC to start, proceeding, to start a proceeding on one ring scams within 120 days of enactment and report to Congress within one year. And it also retains the House language that requires the creation of an advisory committee called the Hospital Robocall Protection Group. Um, so those are the, the major provisions. Like I said, there's a lot in this bill um, that you can uh, take a look for yourself. The Senate wants to pass this. It's unclear when they're gonna get around to it. So um, they're working really hard to figure out a time. Um, Senator Thune, Thune has been quoted that he wanted to get it done this week. Um, if it doesn't happen this week, they have next week. Um, and then uh, we'll see from there. Um, at the end of the year, it doesn't really mean anything. We just move into the next session of this Congress um, and they can take it up in January if they need to. But they, they do wanna get it done as soon as they can. Privacy bills. I think when I was last here with you in, um, in September, we talked about how the Senate wanted to have a bill soon. Um, we now have two bills um, and so um, competing measures, so again, uh, the, most of this year, um, on the Senate side, the Democrats and the Republicans had been trying to work together to come up with a, a, a bipartisan bill that they could all support. Um, ultimately, we now have um, a bill that's been introduced by uh, Senator Cantwell, Schatz, Klobuchar, and Markey. Um, it was introduced last week. It's been referred to the Senate Commerce Committee. Um, it would require covered entities to provide individuals with a right to transparency regarding privacy policies, a right to delete, to correct, control, individual information, and a right to data security. Um, so CEs are defined as any person or entity that is subject to the FTC Act or possesses or transfers covered data. Um, but there is an exclusion um, that for, uh, for any entity that falls within the Act's definition of small business. Um, and so there's some specific things that you would have to meet. Um, and then those, those entities would be excluded from these provisions. So uh, covered entities are not allowed to process or <coughs> transfer covered data beyond what's reasonably necessary and limited to specific purposes um, that they've been, where they've attained express affirmative consent. Um, CEs would not be allowed to condition the provision of a service or product on an individual's agreement to waive privacy rights. So you can't say, I'll give you something extra if you waive your rights. Um, and these provisions would supersede any state law in, a, in direct conflict, but not to be construed to limit any standing state or federal law. Um, there's some issues with regards to a privacy law that's going into effect in California soon. Um, this bill also would require CEs to designate at least one privacy offer, officer and at least one data security officer. Um, and then some of them would have to certify annually to the FTC that they maintain adequate controls um, and that they're complying with the act. Um, this bill is significant in that it provides individuals with a private right of action. Um, it provides the FTC and state's attorneys generals with enforcement powers, requires the FTC to establish a privacy bureau within two years of enactment um, that is ded dedicated to privacy, data security, and other related issues, 
and gives the FTC some um, rulemaking authority to establish processes for um, opt-out and to identify privacy protection requirements for biometric information. In comparison, we have a draft bill from um, Chairman Wicker. Um, he has not introduced this yet, but he did release the text um, around the same time that uh, Senator uh, Cantwell introduced her bill. Um, again, would require co covered entities to publish a privacy policy and make available, uh, make that available to individuals. Um, in this case, uh, CEs are defined as any person who operates in or affects interstate or foreign commerce. Um, there is a that provides for a right to delete, correct, and the portability of covered data. But those, that particular provision does not apply to CEs that meet the bill's definition of small business. It's the same definition in both of the bills, so this obviously is something that they had worked out, um, they were working on earlier. Um, CEs are not allowed to process or transfer covered data um, beyond what's reasonably necessary um, without obtaining express affirmative consent um, from the individual. Again, this provision in this bill specifically does not apply to those CEs that meet the definition of small business. Um, it requires CEs to de designate at least one privacy officer and one least, at least one data security officer, um, and they have to register with the FTC each year um, if they acted as a data broker. Again, provides FTC and state's attorneys generals with enforcement powers. There, um, there is no private right of action in the, in the Republican bill. That's the major difference. Um, Preempts all state law, that's another difference, um, and supersedes any other federal law. Requires the FTC to issue guidelines on best practices for CEs to comply um, with, uh, with data collection and minimization requirements, um, and requires the FTC to issue guidance to, see, to, to CEs to assist with identifying and assessing vulnerabilities in data security. Um, gives the FTC um, the ability to issue regulations on procedures for allowing consumer customers to provide and withdraw consent um, and requirements for CEs when handling data verification requests. Um, that, those are requirements, but it, on the other hand, it only allow, it allows but doesn't require the FTC to establish regulations regarding privacy standards for the transfer of, sen of sensitive biometric information. There's some reporting requirements for the FTC and the Republican bill. Um, to submit to Congress an annual report on enforcement, an algorithm transparency study and report within three years, and a biannual digital content forgery report. So um, those are the major things, um, the major provisions of the Senate bills. Um, again, we'll see in the new year if um, they start to take up this issue and work towards trying to come to agreement on some of these issues. Again, on the House side, we last time around we had a few bills that had been introduced by various members, but not um, not one that was um, introduced by uh, the Energy and Commerce Subcommittee on Consumer Protection. And we still don't have a bill from that particular subcommittee. They they reports are that they're working on something. Instead, we have um, a bill that was introduced by um, Representative Eshu and um, Zoe Lofgren, um, both members from California the Online Privacy Act of 2019. Now, I would encourage you to read this bill too, but it is 132 <coughs> pages, so um, that might take you a bit to get through it. So I condensed it down a little bit to five bullets. So obviously there's a lot of things in this, in the, in this bill that, um, that are not covered by this summary, um, but the, the major provisions, um, again, rather than kicking this to the FTC, this bill would create a new independent agency called the Digital Privacy Agency. Um, and that would be charged with enforcing privacy rights and have authority to hire up to 1,600 full-time equivalent employees. Um, it would provide individuals with the right to access, correct, delete, and transfer data, um, to be informed if a CE has collected information, and to choose how long the data can be kept. Um, covered entities are required, um, and again, this is a, this, there's a lot longer list. These are some of the major ones. Um, they would be required to establish the need and uh, the need for and minimize the user data they collect, process, disclose, and maintain. They are not allowed to disclose or sell personal information without explicit consent. Um, they, CEs would have to use objectively understandable <coughs> privacy policies and consent processes, and they have to employ reasonable cybersecurity policies. Um, and then they have a notification requirement to the DPA if there were any breaches or data sharing by abuses. Um, 
the DPA would have the authority to issue regulations to implement the provisions in the bill and to issue fines for violations. Um, it's the same amount as the FTC, um, 42530 per incident. Um, states' attorney generals can bring civil actions under this language. Um, it does provide an individual right to sue for declaratory or injunctive relief. And it does allow individuals to sue for damages, but does not allow for class action suits. And that's it. Easy. <laughs> <laughs> Easy stuff. Again, the FCC is really not involved in the privacy side of things, um, but we're happy to track it and keep you all updated on it. Yeah. Let me ask you a couple quick questions. Um, so that House bill you just looked through on privacy uh, by the two California legislators, it doesn't preempt the, the bill that they have right now, no. do they, in California? No. Okay, so that's all wrong. Uh, what, what about the um, algorithm transparency? What, what is that related to? Oh, gosh, see, now you're asking me questions that I didn't know to bring <laughs> to. Is that um, like saying, uh, like, well, like, I think like it's, a I think Google would have yeah, to be transparent so, with yeah, their searches? So how, right, yes. and how they're okay. using their algorithms to, yes. um, to, okay. to, to track and to keep track of things. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, were there any questions uh, in the room or on the phone? Yeah, Lori, hi, it's Barry Yubansky. Sorry. Is that Barry? That's Barry. That's yeah. Barry. All right. But it was terrific. Barry, yeah, Barry, can you speak up a little? I can't hear you. Hey, Barry, can you speak up? Hey, Barry? We'll never know. Barry was my first boss. Had a loss. Hey, Barry, are you there? Can you speak up? Uh, we didn't get your question. Yeah, yeah uh, I'm, I'm your team. Yes. Okay. I don't know if he's hearing us. All right. All right. I have, I have a very, very just quick tech thing. Grabbing my oh, sure. Sorry. I was just wondering if we could get uh, copies of the summaries of the bills there. It would be very helpful. Oh, do we have this in our? I don't know if you have it in your folder. Uh, it, I, don't I don't think it's in the folder, but um, uh, we can certainly provide an electronic copy uh, and, and distribute it that way to everybody. Okay. So, thank you. Okay. Uh, were there any uh, other questions uh, uh, here or, or on the phone? Last call. I guess we'll have you back soon enough, right? <laughs> <laughs> Probably. I am, I am now a regular. I guess so. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll, have, we'll, just, we'll just give you a seat next time. Thank you, Lori. Thank you. Yeah, hey, hey, Steve? Yes. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can okay, hear you. Uh, yeah, I just want to point out that, uh, Lori, it was a great presentation. And at this instance, your good deed is appreciated. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you, Barry. Thanks. All right. All right, let me All just right. reload this here. Um, yeah, so we're going with ag. Yep. Yeah. Here we go. <laughs> and there's your selector. Uh, okay, so. So next on our agenda here, we have uh, the presenter is uh, Jesse uh, Jackman. He's a designated uh, federal officer and attorney and advisor at the Telecommunications Access Policy Division. That's uh, the Wireline Bureau. So, uh, yeah, Jesse. Hey, thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. So yes, uh, I am. My name is Jesse Jackman. I am the DFO or the designated federal officer uh, for the Pre Precision Ag Connectivity Task Force, which has a longer name which I'll uh, give you in a second. Uh, and when I'm not doing my role as a DFO for the task force, I am a legal advisor. I was previously in uh, the Telecommunications Access Policy Division. Now I'm in the front office of the Wireline Competition Bureau uh, as a legal advisor and working on all aspects of the Universal Service Fund. Um, so before I get a little bit more into the task force, wanted to just talk a little bit about what precision agriculture is. Um, I figured that would be a little bit useful. Uh, and for that information, I pulled some information. I uh, pulled a document that's available online um, that is made available by our counterparts at the uh, Department of Agriculture, and they have what's called a case for rural broadband. So, precision ag technology is uh, basically using technology to improve agricultural production. 
finding new ways or new technologies and ways of working to combine to improve yields, uh, reduce costs, improve labor efficiency, and increase revenues through greater market access. So a couple uh, examples, common examples are uh, precision ag technology or you know, GPS. You use GPS technology to guide or steer your tractor in the field. Uh, you can have sensors in the ground uh, to monitor things like soil quality, moisture levels, uh, and also drones. Uh, you have drones that are used to fly over large crop fields to identify pest problems and look at overall crop health. Uh, so how are these technologies applied to stages of agricultural management? So as USDA describes here, there's stage one, which is the planting stage. Um, and these aren't all my slides, but oh, okay. yeah, so I just, you know, went to get some background this morning on these. So you have data collection and decision support to make better choices about what, where, uh, and when to produce using data analytics, field prescriptions, fertility planning. Then during the production stage, precision agriculture also comes in monitoring the growth cycle, uh, managing inputs and optimizing uh, the product's uh, health and harvest. You're talking about real-time censoring, uh, automated harvesting, things like that. And then finally, there's market coordination. This is stage three that they have, creating access to new customers uh, and channels, differentiating products and shaping consumer preferences. This is online sales, targeted advertising and optimizing distribution. So what are the societal benefits of precision agriculture? In other words, you know, how, are this, how are these technologies going to benefit consumers? Well, a few things that are listed here. 7.5% uh, fewer people at risk of hunger in developing countries. Two seconds to trace food products um, using blockchain-enabled records. 40% uh, less uh, fuel burn, uh, lower water <coughs> usage, or uh, being more efficient with water, 20 to 50% or more and uh, up to 80% reduction in chemical applications. So all these are kind of the benefits of precision agriculture, uh, but this doesn't really work. In other, in other words, to realize the benefits of precision agriculture, we need connectivity on agricultural lands. So that's kind of where the uh, task force comes in. And so the formal title of the committee is the task force for reviewing the connectivity and technology needs of precision agriculture in the United States. So essentially what the task force is charged with is providing advice and recommendations to the FCC, to USDA, and others on how to assess and advance the deployment of broadband internet access on unserved agricultural land in order to promote precision agriculture. In other words, promote the connectivity. So this is actually a statutory committee. Congress directed the FCC in the 2018 Farm Bill, so this was a little less than a year ago, to establish the task force in consultation with USDA, the Department of Agriculture. The task force is, just like this, subject to the Federal Advisory Committee Act, and members have a two-year term, uh, and under the statute, it's the Federal Advisory Committee is gonna run to the end of 2025. So this is kind of just broad what the task force is assessed with. So it must assess the current state of broadband in agricultural lands, along with the broadband needs of precision agriculture technologies and agricultural lands. So the task force is required to submit reports to the chairman annually consistent with <coughs> sections 12511 of the 2018 Farm Bill. So this is the section of the Farm Bill uh, directing the FCC to establish this task force. And so this part of the, uh, this section of the Farm Bill also lays out in detail what the goals of the task force are. Uh, so in addition to these reports that are uh, mandated in the statute itself, the task force is also going to produce reports they're not expressly required by the bill, but are consistent with the duties of the task force. So if you look at the statute, there are some duties and there are some reports, and these are things that the task force is gonna uh, produce. All these reports will be made public, and the task force was actually officially established uh, just recently, December 4th, 2019. So just a little bit about the makeup of the task force. Uh, so as you're all aware, Membership balance plan is an important aspect of any federal advisory committee. You have to have a diverse point of views um, and everything like that. Fortunately for us, this was laid out in the statute for us, so we knew exactly the kind of categories of people that were going to make up this task force. Um, and it's an interesting um, group of people, very diverse and something that you wouldn't typically think would be coming to the FCC, so we got to meet a really interesting group in that uh, respect. Uh, so we have agricultural producers representing diverse geographic areas, different types of farms, uh, small farmers, uh, agricultural producer representing tribal agriculture, internet service provider, fixed, uh, mobile, 
um, and infrastructure providers as well. So if you think of tower companies, representatives of the electric co-op industry, uh, representatives of the satellite industry, uh, equipment manufacturers, drone manufacturers, uh, any manufacturers that are involved in precision ag technology, uh, representatives from state and local governments, and representatives, representatives with relevant expertise in data, uh, broadband mapping, geospatial analysis, and coverage mapping. And again, fairly balanced in terms of their viewpoints, technology, uh, and things of that nature. Now, the statute also does limit us to 15 members. Uh, so you can see we had um, a bit of work to do on trying to figure out how do we get 15 members within that. If you kind of add it up, it doesn't really equal 15, uh, but we were uh, able to get uh, 15 members representing uh, these different areas. Uh, in addition to those 15 members, we do have one member of the task force, uh, a USDA ex officio non-voting member. So this person sits on the task force representing the USDA. And then uh, finally, a little bit about the working groups, which we are in the process of setting up, but we have announced what they will be. Uh, the working groups will be the mapping and analyzing connectivity on agricultural lands, uh, examining the current and future connectivity demand for precision agriculture, uh, encouraging adoption of precision agriculture and availability of high quality jobs on connected farms. And then finally, accelerating broadband deployment on unserved agricultural lands. So those are the four working groups uh, that we have. So we actually just had our first meeting earlier this week on Monday and the members have been really excited to get started. Uh, we are also in the process of standing up these working groups. Uh, we have the chairs and vice chairs of the working groups which uh, we announced Friday of last week on the 6th. Uh, and the FCC and USDA teams are actively working to review applications to stand up the working groups. And so that's uh, where we stand today. Okay. Uh, do we have any questions for Jesse? Um, hey, Matthew. Hey, Matt Gers with CTIA. Um, thanks. This is, sounds like it's very going to be a very interesting uh, task force, particularly with the announcement last week on the new 5G fund. and, mm -hmm. and um, how the commission may be thinking about allocating funding for agricultural lands as well. Um, two questions. When are the applications for the working groups due? So, so the applications for the working groups were actually uh, due uh, December 3rd. So the, that's closed. They are, but I, th I think we would be willing to entertain additional applications. Okay. And how does, can you <coughs> help us understand how the Farm Bill defines agricultural lands as opposed to just general rural areas? Uh, yeah, so one thing um, also about the working groups, if people had already applied but weren't selected, they will also be in the running from the working groups. So in terms of the agricultural lands, uh, we're really, um, so a lot of the things I think in the statute themselves aren't necessarily answered in the statute or defined. And so that's uh, a lot what we've tasked the task force to do and the working groups within there are to kind of go out and figure out what, you know, what is, what does agricultural lands mean? So those are things that we're looking for the task force to find. I think, I don't have the, um, a good definition in front of me, but this is something I think we would defer to USDA on, uh, as they are, they keep a wealth of data and information uh, on agricultural lands, uh, what's cropped, or uh, what crops are planted where. So you kind of think about it as, at least in, uh, initially, possibly um, taking their USDA's data on agricultural lands and somehow merging that or overlaying uh, data on broadband deployment, and kind of getting an initial sense on that. But yes, those are all questions that the task force will look at. Okay. Um, any other questions here in the room or on the phone? Well, Jesse, thank you so thank much. Thank you. All right. Thank you for having me. Okay. So, so next, um, we're going to get an update um, on the Connected Care Grant Pilot Program, um, and here to present is uh, Rashawn Duval, uh, she's attorney advisor, Telecom Access Policy Division with the wireline, not wireless, uh, communications bureau. And with that, let me turn it over to you. Hey, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, glad to see so many familiar faces in the room. Uh, so you guys are learning a lot. I've learned a little bit uh, since I've been sitting back here as well. Um, as you mentioned, I'm Rashawn Duval. I'm an attorney advisor with the Wireline Competition Bureau Telecommunications Access Policy Division. And I'm pleased to be here today to give you a brief overview of the, thank you, uh, the notice of proposed rulemaking that the commission adopted in July for a connected care pilot program. 
Uh, many of you may already be familiar with this proceeding, um, and I know some of your organizations have filed comments in this proceeding as well, so we're very thankful and uh, grateful for that always. Um, if you haven't had a chance to review the notice, notice of proposed rulemaking, um, it is available in docket number WC18213, uh, FCC1964 uh, is the document number, um, and feel free to reach out to me afterwards and I can send you a link directly to the NPRM if you'd like that. So as many of you are aware, uh, the Commission has supported healthcare providers' access to communications technologies through the rural healthcare programs. Um, the rural healthcare support program uh, is comprised of two distinct components, uh, the telecommunications program and the Healthcare Connect Fund program. In July 2019, the Commission adopted a notice of proposed rulemaking that proposed and sought comment on a pilot program that would help defray eligible health care providers' costs of providing connected care technologies to low-income Americans and veterans. Uh, during my talk, I will refer to this notice of proposed rulemaking either as the Connected Care Notice or NPRM. Health care providers are increasingly using broadband to provide connected care medical services to patients in their homes. So this is moving beyond the traditional brick-and-mortar facilities, um, and providers are just able to do really just amazing things uh, with these new technologies. These services, however, require both the provider and the patient to have connectivity. Some examples of the types of connected care services that are being provided include video visits with physicians, um, as well as remote patient monitoring, um, which requires devices that might collect a patient's data, such as you know, a blood pressure monitor or um, a glucose monitor, and then that data would, the device would collect that information and then transmit that information to medical professionals. Um, there are just a lot of really interesting technologies being developed in uh, connected care services right now, and it's just really an exciting area to, uh, just really exciting area. Um, there is also a lot of growing evidence of the benefits of connected care services, including improved health outcomes and reduced health care costs. The proposed Connected Care Pilot Program would actually be separate from the existing telecommunications program and the Healthcare Connect Fund program. Uh, by way of background, uh, for the telecommunications program, which is one of the existing rural healthcare programs, that program was created in 1997 to ensure that eligible rural healthcare providers pay no more than their urban counterparts for telecommunications services. As part of that program, um, eligible rural health care providers receive a discount on eligible telecommunications services, which is determined by the difference, if any, between the urban and rural rates for telecommunications services. For that program, um, the supported services include, but are not limited to, traditional telephone service, voice, and facsimile services. The uh, Healthcare Connect Fund program is also an existing Rural Health Care Fund program that was created in 2012 to expand eligible health care provider access to broadband, especially in rural areas, and encourage the creation of state and regional broadband networks for health care. Through that program, eligible health care providers and consortium applicants receive a flat 65% discount on an array of advanced telecommunications and information services, including but not limited to internet access, dark fiber, business data, uh, traditional DSL service, private carriage services, and network equipment necessary to make a supported service function. With the connected care notice, uh, as I mentioned, the uh, proposed connected care pilot would be separate from those existing programs. Uh, the Connected Care Notice proposed establishing a pilot program with a $100 million budget for a three-year funding period duration. As proposed in the Connected Care Notice, um, the following services and equipment could potentially be supported through that program. Uh, broadband internet access services to provide connected care services. This would include the healthcare provider's own internet access service and internet access service that patients would use in their home or on a mobile device. Um, as I previously mentioned, the existing rural health care programs primarily for, focus on the health care provider's connectivity, so extending it to the, allowing health care providers to purchase connectivity that the patient could then use at our home would be, at their homes, would then be something different um, from the existing programs. For the connected care pilot program, the NPRM also pro proposed 
funding network equipment necessary to enable connectivity for the purposes of connected care. And this could include things like routers and servers. Um, it also proposed uh, supporting packages or suites of services that are considered information services used to provide connected care services. Um, I will note that the connected care notice did not propose funding end user devices, for example, tablets, cell phones, medical devices, or mobile applications unless they were part of an information service that would be supported, uh, or healthcare provider administrative expenses associated with participating in the pilot program. And these are things that the Commission has not traditionally funded through the uh, existing USF programs or prior pilots that the Commission has established. The Connected Care Notice envisioned that participating healthcare providers would purchase the supported services and equipment. So, as the notice envisions that this would be more of a healthcare provider driven um, type of program. And it sought comment on whether healthcare providers should be required to competitively bid for the supported services and equipment. Um, with respect to eligible healthcare providers and broadband providers, the Connected Care Notice proposed limiting the pilot program to nonprofit and public health care providers that fall within the following statutory categories that are currently used for the Commission's rural health care programs, <coughs> the existing programs. And this would be post secondary educational institutions offering health care instruction, teaching hospitals and medical schools, community health centers or health centers providing health care to migrants, local health departments or agencies, community mental health centers, not for profit hospitals rural health clinics, skilled nursing facilities, and consortia of healthcare providers consisting of one or more of the above types of entities. The Connected Care Notice proposed not limiting the pilot program to broadband providers that have obtained a designation as an eligible telecommunications carrier. The Connected Care Notice proposed giving healthcare providers flexibility to design the pilot projects and does not propose limiting pilot projects to specific geographic areas or health conditions. With respect to the discount level, uh, the Connected Care Notice proposed uh, <coughs> that participating healthcare providers would receive a flat 85% discount on the supported services and equipment eligible for support through the pilot program. Uh, healthcare providers would be responsible for the remaining portion of the costs. The Connected Care Notice proposed not to set a fixed number of pilot projects or set a limit on the amount of funding that could provi be provided to a single project. The Connected Care Notice also sought comment on funding source, sources that eligible health care providers could use to pay their share of the costs. And under this structure, I think what the notice envisions is that the health care provider would be receiving a discount on its bill and the service provider would be reimbursed for the eligible um, discounted costs. And this is very similar to the way the funding structure currently works under the existing rural health care programs. Uh, the NPRM envisions that there would be an application process for the pilot program. Um, healthcare providers would submit an application to the Commission that would address various application criteria in order to participate in the pilot program, including identifying uh, the participating patients. And the Connected Care Notice also sought comment on the factors that should be used to evaluate the pilot program applications. And it also proposed awarding additional points to pilot projects that serve certain geographic areas or populations where there are healthcare disparities, for example, rural areas, tribal areas, or just um, healthcare providers that might be located in urban areas but might primarily serve a rural population. Um, and also proposed awarding additional points to pilot projects that would treat certain health crises or chronic conditions. Some examples are opioid dependency, high risk pregnancies, heart disease, or diabetes. Uh, finally, the uh, Connected Care Notice proposed and sought comment on four goals. Um, this is improving health outcomes through connected care, reducing health care costs, supporting the trend towards connected care everywhere, and determining how universal service support can positively impact existing telehealth initiatives. Um, with respect to current status, which I know is always something that people are always interested in, um, so as many of you know, uh, in August and September, interested parties filed comments and reply comments in our proceeding. Um, and the official comment cycle uh, for the Connected Care Notice has closed at this point. Uh, we are still reviewing and evaluating the comments and reply comments. Um, and in terms of next steps in order to move forward, uh, the Commission would need to issue an order for the pilot program. And with that, I'll open up to uh, any questions anybody might have about the uh, proposed pro program. Yes. Hi, this is Christina Clearwater. Can you give us an example of um, that would help us uh, uh, understand the difference uh, 
and how this differs from the existing program. Uh, for example, if I am a, a provider sort of uh, in a clinic on tribal lands, uh, so what is, what is the additional coverage that the notice is uh, proposing? Sure, that's an excellent question. I think uh, there are two things that I think the additional notice would be covering. Um, as I mentioned, you know, with respect to this program, it's primarily, fo it's, it's focused on connected care services. So it's that additional element of allowing the healthcare provider to purchase connectivity for the patient to also use in their home. So the way the current programs are structured, they will purchase the connectivity for the uh, healthcare provider to have broadband access, but do not include anything for patients to access it at home. So that's kind of a limit. Patients would need to go to their doctor's facilities or already have their own existing broadband in order to take advantage of connected care services. So for example, if, if I am somebody who resides on tribal lands and I have a chronic condition like diabetes, mm -hmm. then the medical provider would, um, let's say there's a device that can monitor glucose levels, mm -hmm. then the medical provider would um, perhaps be able to subsidize. Yeah, that's exactly right. And, okay. you know, what we're aware of is, you know, based on the record, there are a number of uh, physicians that are already subsidizing this type of thing for patients with chronic conditions or low-income patients already. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. okay. great. That, that's really helpful. Thank good, you so much. Good question. Mm -hmm. um, any other questions? Um, anyone on the phone? Well, great. Okay. Well, thank you so much for explaining that. Thank you so much, and thank you all for your time. Um, again, if you have any other questions about the uh, proposed pilot program, um, please, feel re please feel free to reach out to me directly. I'm uh, Rashawn Duval again. My email is rashawnduval at ftc.gov, um, and I'm pretty easy to find on the website. There's only two Duvals here at the commission. <laughs> <laughs> yep. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, um, yeah. Let, let's just take a quick five-minute break. Yeah, we, we'll, we'll, yeah, just real quick five minutes uh, as we. Uh, oh, actually, we have. We're ready to go. So never mind. Yeah, so we're going to get an update right now on uh, consumer scams, which is it right here, and uh, we have a presenter is uh, Christy Thompson. Uh, she's uh, chief of the Telecommunications Consumer Division Enforcement Bureau. Your card. I promise no one's in trouble. <laughs> except the bad guys. Except for the bad guys. Okay. Uh, thank you so much for for having me here. It's a it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I, I started out life as a as a basically an antitrust lawyer in the media bureau and had no idea that I would end up a consumer protection lawyer, although I think my standing at the Berkeley Alumni Association has risen substantially as a result. <laughs> so uh, I'm very, very delighted to be here and absolutely believe in the work that this, that this committee does. Uh, I was asked to give a, a little update on the con on consumer scams that are going on. My favorite subject. It is a, an obsession for me and my staff and what we spend the majority of our time uh, fighting these days as too many Americans know full well. Uh, the big ticket item that pretty much all Americans are dealing with right now are imposter scams. Mm -hmm. Those are the worst scams happening that have been for years. These are, are primarily executed through illegal robocalls, uh, illegal spoofed robocalls. There's an, an entire book of, of uh, legislation that I like to throw at the bad guys. Uh, and more legislation, I'm happy to say, has, has, uh, is coming down the pike. Mm -hmm. uh, Frank Pallone promised that a robocall bill would be on the president's desk before the end of the year. And, and, and I am so delighted to see that it, it looks like that may actually happen, which is very exciting. Uh, the government imposter robocalls are, as, as we all know, for years they have been the IRS calls. We're, we are talking about transnational robocalling, I don't know, quasi-terrorist cells basically operating overseas that uh, their entire business model is to call up Americans, pretend to be some uh, government agency, and then try to scare, cajole, convince, anything, sometimes all three, 
in the same call uh, Americans to give up their confidential information and provide them with financial payments that the, that the victim does not owe to any, uh, any American government agency. Formerly, it was the IRS. These were IRS calls. You must, the, the messages would say things like, you owe uh, $5,000 in back taxes. If you don't contact us and call us back immediately, we'll send the sheriff to your house. Um, they have switched up the, the scam in recent, in just in the past year. And now where it was the IRS, now it's a social security scam. And it's the Social Security Administration that is learning the uh, joys of, of uh, a robocalling campaign that takes their name in vain. Now what consumers are facing are robocalls that say, the, so you owe money to the Social Security Administration or you were improperly given <laughs> benefits that you don't owe. Again, there's a threat of law enforcement action, the local police or the FBI, or they, they uh, name any sorts of organizations will come after you if you don't pay up now. The, the mechanism that they demand payment is, is the same, and that's not surprising because it's the same organizations, the same groups of people, primarily operating uh, out, of, out of India, who are making these calls, they've just switched up their message a little bit. So they're still demanding iTunes, payment in iTunes cards, or Google Play cards, or Steam cards, uh, or prepaid, prepaid cards. There's an entire cottage industry of scammers um, that are, that are even, even have active Facebook groups where they talk to each other about, this scam is working right now, or no, you need, you, don't, don't do it this way. You need to pitch it this way instead. Or I'm offering to buy, you know, on, on 10 cents a dollar all of your iTunes cards, that, you know, iTunes stuff that you get in and, and a, a whole network. We, we expect, so two things from this. One, we are learning every day better how to go after the, the entities that are responsible for these scams. And behind the scenes in ways that unfortunately I, I can't talk talk about or reveal publicly, we are continuing to make strides to shut down these networks. Secondly, this really illustrates, the developments over the past year really illustrate how the scammer cottage industry is very adaptive. They have, they have IRS calls stopped being effective, so they have switched up to the Social Security Administration. Mm -hmm. And now a new federal agency is getting up to speed, just as, as the IRS had to get up to speed with how to deal with that. We expect that the scammers are, want to stay in business. There may be other, they, they may switch up again. It may not be the Social Security Administration anymore. It could be, maybe it's the Veterans Administration next. Maybe it's some other government agency. Maybe they start picking on state agencies. The point is, we, we already predict that this may happen and are, and we have to be flexible and adaptive just as they're adaptive to move very quickly. The good news is we are, we are and I'll talk about this in, in a little bit, uh, we, are, we are putting structures in place to make that easier going forward so we don't have to start from scratch every time the bad guys switch up their scam. The other major scam that is going on that, that a, a lot of Americans find uh, baffling and somewhat frightening are what we're calling the Chinese consulate scams. If you have ever gotten a robocall where when you listen to the message, the message is in Mandarin, uh -huh. that is a, a major scam that's going on. It is targeted, it, it is a, it is a, they're taking a shotgun approach, so they're robocalling basically everybody, but the targets of the scam are much more narrow. They are looking for Chinese expats or the Chinese immigrant community. Interestingly enough, this scam started uh, hitting area codes that had significant Chinese immigrant or expat populations. So San Francisco was the, very f was the first identified target. After that, it moved on to New York, then DC, and it, it, continues, and it continues to grow. Now it appears they're just robocalling everybody. But the point of the, the, or, or the, the hook in the Chinese consulate scam the message says, this is a Chinese government. You or your family owe, uh, owe, taxes, uh, owe taxes to the Chinese government. If you don't pay, then your family or you may be jailed. It's, a, it's apparently a frightening message. And it names the, uh, a real Chinese agency that actually does police 
uh, the payment of taxes by foreign nationals who are living who are living over outside of the country, and the threat is the threat is very compelling. We are especially concerned about this particular threat first uh, because it is because it is so it is so evil <laughs> you know, just as a as a matter of you know principle, but then secondly because it has a disproportionate effect on an already vulnerable mm. population within the United States, which is the Chinese immigrant commu community. We're very concerned about that. That is another major scam that we are, we are tracking. Again, these are, these are scams very similar to the IRS and, and, and Social Security Administration impersonation scams that we also believe are originating outside the country. That makes enforcement challenging, but we are continuing to develop ways to shut that off. Um, so a little bit about, uh, and then sorry, let me move on to the kind of the last category of, of scams that are that we see, uh, and those are, are what I call scumbag telemarketing. In my, <laughs> that's that's the technical term for it. Uh, it. it. Right, right now the sort of the biggest, <laughs> the uh, the biggest one of these that's happening, in just in the last three to four months, are the healthcare healthcare scam calls, where. Uh, they're, they're pitching health insurance plans, et cetera. There's been a number of, of press articles about this. Yeah. Not surprisingly, these the healthcare scams uh, ramp up around open enrollment seasons. Mm -hmm. So while we're all kind of thinking about health, health insurance, we're probably getting all, or at least I'm getting, a lot of emails from, from our HR departments about open enrollment and health insurance plans. Well, the scammers know this too, and they are timing, just like the IRS folks used to time their IRS threatening calls around April 16th, and the months before that, the health insurance scammers are doing the same thing around, around tax time and around open enrollment season. So we're seeing spikes of that happening late in the year and then again in like March and April of every year. That's another thing that we are, uh, that, that we are tracking. There are a plethora of other telemarketing robocalls that happen uh, on a much on a more patchwork basis or sometimes a nationwide basis. Uh, I want to note that there is a significant variation in the quality of the offerings that are being pitched. Some of those robocalls are legitimate products. They're just done in a really illegal and problematic manner. Some of them are outright frauds and it really depends on which robocall campaign you're talking about and what kind of uh, offerings that they're they're discussing that to tell the difference uh, all of them are annoying all of them are are uh, illegal when they're when they're uh, robocalls to cell phones or in other inappropriate ways or or they happen without the consumers express written consent uh, and no one has any sympathy for the illegal telemarketing robocallers certainly not me and my folks. Uh, the other major, other major part of enforcement action that we're looking at are uh, spoofing continues to be a problem. I've said before that spoofing is gasoline on the robocalling fire. It allows the bad guys to completely hide what they are, what they are doing, or nearly completely hide. It makes it much more difficult to tell where who is actually responsible for the telephone call. That is something that I know. There's another panel right after this talking about caller ID authentication. Uh, a way that we can we can make it much more difficult for the originator of a robocall to hide their true identity. I'm excited about it because that will also make it much easier for uh, on the enforcement side to find targets for enforcement and to take appropriate enforcement actions against them. So that instead of uh, instead of 10 cases a year, we can we can do 100. That would be that would be fantastic. Or as many cases it, as it takes to get the bad guys to go into a different line of business, like, I don't know, sell hot dogs or something, <laughs> and something that's, that's legitimate. So over the past year, there have been some exciting developments in uh, attacking these consumer frauds. We are seeing way more <coughs> government cooperation, in particular between states and the federal government. Uh, my organization in particular has executed memoranda of understanding between multiple states now to cooperate on robocalling and spoofing matters. The states have significant anti-fraud and robocall little mini FTC acts on the books that they are raring and excited to bring against violators. And we are, to put it mildly, in a target-rich environment. <laughs> so maximizing the, uh, the uh, dollars spent by the government by divvying up the work 
among all of us who share some authority and some power to, to punish and deter uh, these kinds of violations is just an exercise in good government, if not just straight up math, mathematics. Uh, we are also seeing significantly more industry cooperation. Uh, long ago, more than 10 years ago, some of us kind of labored in the wilderness trying to get folks to, to pay attention to the robocalling threat and suggest that, uh, that the telecom industry in particular had a role to play in, in helping crack down on, on uh, problematic robocalls. For a while, there was, some, there was some skepticism, but I'm here to tell you now that skepticism is gone. And what we have instead is is actual commitment uh, backed up by companies spending dollars to solve the problem and to help develop new tools that will solve the problem. That is, that is a really good sign. Uh, there is recognition at the, at the highest levels of the telecom entities that we deal with and regulate that combating frauds, combating telephone frauds, is not only a good idea, but is absolutely necessary. We are already seeing consumer behavior change, and this probably won't be a surprise to any of you, because if anyone here says that, that they answer telephone calls from numbers they don't recognize, I will be shocked. That is a huge difference. 10 years ago, if you got a call from a number you didn't recognize, you probably picked up. Now, your voicemail gets, gets to hear your calls, 90% of your calls or more. That is a, a significant change to consumer behavior. And whenever there is a significant change to consumer behavior, it drives where the market is going. If consumers no longer value their voice telephone service, that changes, that changes and potentially threatens a lot of services and a lot of offerings that depend on voice telephone service. That's an existential threat to a telephone service company. So there's a clear understanding that this is a, this is a problem and we need to do something about it. There, is, there has been significant investment in the authentication process, which I, which I won't talk too much because that's uh, that won't steal anybody's thunder. Uh, and there's also a greater willingness to innovate on both, both in terms of how they interact with us on the enforcement side and how uh, offerings that, that uh, companies make available to consumers like blocking, uh, blocking apps and other features of telephone service that make it easier for consumers to decide which calls they want to accept and which ones they don't. All of these are, are critically important protective measures that uh, are necessary as we combat these scams. Uh, I have said multiple times to uh, legislative staff, to members of the public, to, uh, to companies and, and uh, to advocates, there is no one solution to the robocalling and the spoofing problem. It takes, it's going to take a hundred different solutions all working together in concert to solve the problem and protect consumers. That is what makes it uh, so difficult to clamp down why we can't just throw a switch and block all the bad calls because it, it, technologically and legally it's a complex problem that requires a, a complex set of solutions. But we are making great progress. Uh, we will continue to emphasize enforcement actions, taking actions against the bad guys, making examples of them. One of the things that we are trying to do is convince the scammer industry that they need to go into a different line of work and that the <laughs> economics uh, are no longer in their favor. We want to make it more costly than cost effective to engage in these kinds of, of scams. And we'll do that by enforcement actions, by disrupting networks, by by blocking, by public shaming, by anything that we can to change the economics so that this is no longer a low risk, high reward kind of activity. As I mentioned before, there is promising legislation that uh, is, is coming down the pike that will both increase the penalties for, for this kind of illegal activity, make it easier to enforce and also streamline the ways that industry and government work together to identify the culprits and put them out of business. Um, and I just want to end with uh, on, a, on a note of hope and, and talk about a completely different kind of consumer uh, harm that was the, a great focus 10 years ago and, and up till just about five or six years ago. Do you all remember, do you all remember cramming? 
Do you remember uh, unauthorized charges on your cell phone bills, those 99 cent, those 99 cent charges? Ten years ago, or back in 2011, the Senate had a, a whole series of hearings and there was a 50-page report on the problem of cramming. And it was the, 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 the major consumer protection problem of its time. And there was a recognition at the highest levels of Congress that we needed to do something about this. And I'm pleased to say that that, that is what we did. We went out and, and tackled the cramming problem and our complaints about unauthorized charges now are a tiny trickle compared to what they were in 2011, 2012, 13, and 14. I, I, I offer this as, a, as an example that we have the same dedicated folks who worked on the cramming problem who are now working on this robocalling problem. And we have the same goal in mind, which is to solve this problem and if a new one comes up, to tackle, to tackle the new one. There will always be threats to consumers. There will always be potential harms because there are always people who want to take advantage of other people. We will continue to adapt and attack those problems as they happen, but I think there is room to have hope and to, and to be happy that we have succeeded in the past and we can succeed again. And with that, are there any, any questions or anything that I can, that I can talk about? All right, Eric. Thank you, Eric Cook, and thank you for an excellent presentation. I have two questions. Um, another one of the evil ones, and they're all evil, maybe it's just different <laughs> degrees, but another one you didn't mention is the grandchild phone call. Oh, yes. And I'd like for you to, to talk a little bit about that. I'd be one. happy to. And then uh, kind of related to that is I wonder if the data actually underreports the problem due to the shame and embarrassment that victims feel particularly elderly, and whether you know that data underreports that, and, and how we go about quantifying that, and I guess kind of comes back to education, you know, uh, yes. particularly That's to America's seniors. So comment on those two things. I, I would be I would be happy to because those are those are things that I think about every single day. The grand just your first part, the grandparent scam. This is the scam where uh, a, a a malicious caller calls up. Uh, they target communities that have significant populations of elderly folks, but really they'll try to get anybody. Um, and they say, your, your grandchild, uh, I, I can say my, my own uncle uh, had this happen to him and unfortunately he was a victim of, of this scam. Uh, he, he got a call from someone who said, your, your son is in Mexico and uh, was jailed and you need to send us $500 to pay for the attorney to bail him out of, of jail. Um, unfortunately, my cousins being kind of the people that they are, this was not an entirely implausible story. <laughs> I'm sorry to say. And unfortunately, it worked. He ponied up the $500 or however, however much it was, and then only later realized that this was a complete scam, that he had in fact lost his money. Uh, to, to a scammer. There are multiple people out there who run this scam. It is a popular scam. It has been going on for decades. Uh, robocalling and, and free, and not free, but cheap VoIP dialing has made it easier to do and has particularly made it easier for uh, scammers outside the country to perpetrate these kinds of scams. So it is, uh, to your second port of point about underreporting, yeah, and I have a personal experience with this. Uh, you all know the story of my uncle. Not a single member of my family does because he swore me to secrecy that I should not tell my grandmother, my parents, any of, any of his siblings or anybody else because he was so ashamed, so deeply ashamed that he, a very smart, a very smart person, college educated, prides himself on, on being savvy, had fallen for had fallen for the scam. It was deeply humiliating to him. He's probably mortified if he knew that I was explaining that this was going on. So I'm sorry, and it's sorry in advance. But uh, yeah, it is a significant underreporting problem. We we hear about only a fraction of the people who are victimized this way. So what do we do about that? Uh, one thing that the commission has done is partner with entities like AARP to do more consumer education. We are trying to to uh, convince elders in particular, it's not something to be ashamed of. 
you didn't do something wrong, the scammer did something wrong. And if anyone should feel ashamed, it's them. We're trying to spread that message as much as possible and to empower consumers who, who uh, may be the victim of this particular scam to recognize the signs in advance so that they can avoid that problem altogether. We've done significant work over the last year trying to get that message out to vulnerable populations in particular, uh, and that continues to be a focus. May, may I ask a follow-up? Sure. Thank you. Is, is there a role in retailer education to play in this, and are there initiatives where our, our big box retailers and others, you know, might be able when somebody like your uncle shows up and buys five hundred or a thousand dollars worth of Google Play cards. Is there some inquiry that that can be made in, in a both a legal and respectful sort of way? <coughs> General question: Can retailers be engaged in this? Yes, if that's the payment mechanism. Yes, retailers can, and in fact, they are. There was a significant effort with CVS because so many. Uh, of the victims of the the uh, IRS Social Security Administration card, grandparent scam cards, the, the one the, uh, calls, the ones that are that are demanding payment in these, you know, Steam cards or iTunes gift cards. Uh, there has been a significant push to to entities like CVS. They're now training their their uh, cashiers and staff members to recognize the signs of a of a scam when someone comes up and has you know, an arm full of iTunes cards no. and says, <coughs> I need $5,000 worth of iTunes cards. Uh, some of the companies I understand have, have started putting limits in place. So you know, maximizing, you can only do $500 maximum or $200 maximum in purchases at a time to try and slow down that process so that somebody can say, hey, wait a minute, why are you buying all of these cards What's going on here? Who told you you needed all? No, the IRS does not accept payment, does not accept tax payments in iTunes cards. <laughs> to try something that we can do to slow it down, get the victim to get out of of the the tunnel of the, uh, that what he's been he or she's been told is going to happen to him by the scanner. Uh, step back and think about what the situation really is, and, and question that whole that whole process. Posting, posting notices. Yes. And the sales too. Yes. Customized. So we've we've seen notices being posted up in grocery stores, drug stores, saying hey, if someone is if someone is uh, telling you that you need to buy a whole bunch of iTunes cards, this is a known scam. Don't do it. Uh, over the air announcements, you know, on the on the PA system, as the as the music is playing, there's also announcements. You know, this is a scam. Don't do it, etc. Every we, we're think if there's new creative ways. Uh, to do that, we are open to ideas as well and, and would welcome feedback uh, from all of you if you have additional ideas that we should think about or, or avenues to explore. And along the same lines as a state legislator myself, any advice you have to us for state level solutions I'd be very interested in. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, 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 speaking as an enforcer, I'm always in, I'm always in favor of better enforcement tools that make it easier for. Uh, so sorry, that's the, that's my self-serving ask. Uh, so empower your state your state uh, AG offices to the extent necessary. They are they live with with their laws inside and out. They probably have ideas for you to say you know how can you strengthen. That's the conversation that you know we and our counterparts at the FTC had at the federal level with you know the current legislation. Uh, the legislators came to us and said we have uh, ideas that we want to do. Let's let's talk about what the problems are that you see. That's a that's a way to help. Uh, anything, mostly it's like attention. We need we need to get. We need to do as much consumer education as as we possibly can, and reach out to consumers that don't maybe don't interact with the government every single day. There are willing there are willing industry participants on the telephone side uh, that would be that are you know happy to do PSAs that are happy to do uh, consumer outreach efforts. Organizations like AARP or other organizations that serve particularly vulnerable populations. I mentioned the, the Chinese expat and immigrant community. I would suggest you know, reaching out to, to organizations that serve immigrant communities in particular and saying, what are, what are we doing together to, uh, to get the word out about the scam and protect, and protect people? Uh, that's the kind of thing that, that uh, those organizations that, that work with particular populations probably have some great ideas and would welcome some additional government 
impetus behind uh, behind those ideas. Thank you. Okay. Um, we have time for one more. <laughs> if we can get one more. Yeah, m make sure your hand's up, too, so we can get the mics on. Vonda Long, AT&T. Christy, we appreciate you, Wonder Woman. <laughs> I just have to tell you that. Um, I have a question about, do you, are you seeing an uptick in complaints around ringless voicemail scams? Because um, as, you know, implementation of Shake and Stir gets closer, uh, scammers are looking for other means of scamming people. Yes, yes they are, and the answer, the answer is yes. Uh, so those of you who may not be familiar with what a ringless voicemail is, there are some companies that have developed uh, kind of a software technology that attempts to that attempts to contact you on your phone, but what they're hoping to do is not actually ring your phone. They just want to drop a voicemail in your voicemail box without your telephone ever ringing. The reason now why would they do this? for two reasons. One, they think it's, ironically, they think it's less intrusive, and I'll, <laughs> I'll talk about that in just a second. But then secondly, what they're trying to do is avoid liability under federal laws that say you can't ring somebody's telephone, you can't call someone for a telemarketing purpose without the prior express written consent of that consumer. So their brilliant idea is, great, I'll leave them a voicemail and then I'm not actually making a call. The problem is, and, and this is a message I try to communicate to companies that are looking for these kind of innovative, you know, work around the law kind of solutions, is that you get in trouble when you do things that violate consumer expectations. And to put it bluntly, consumers are freaked out when they get calls, when they get phantom voicemails that their phones never rang, but suddenly there's a voicemail. Their first thought is, this phone sucks, my service sucks, I'm not getting calls, it's dropping calls, I'm not receiving it. And then their second thought is when they realize that no, the phone never actually rang is, how do they do that? That's creepy. Who else is getting into my voicemails? I don't want this to happen. There's a whole lot of consumer angst about this technology. So the answer to your question is yes, we are getting significantly more consumer complaints. Uh, I also say that some of the entities that are making these kind of calls or think they have a solution are not nearly as effective as they think they are because what happens is their ringless voicemail actually rings the phone once and then it drops it into voicemail and that aggravates consumers too. That is a problem we are, we are looking at. I can't comment too much more, more past that, but we are aware that consumers are not happy with this, this new thing <laughs> that they're dealing with. Christy, thank you so much. Was there anyone on the phone that had a question before we um, move on? So, well, thank you so much. Thank you. You can, you can tell there was a lot of interest <laughs> in that topic. I, I love my job. <laughs> thank you. All right. Well, thank you. Okay. So, um, all right. So, Michael, um, so on the next uh, next on the agenda, um, we have uh, Michael uh, Santarelli. Uh, you want me to move to the slides? Okay. Let's see here. Here we go. Okay. Here's your pointer. Okay, great. Am I on? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. Hi, everyone. Um, so, Michael Santarelli, I am a co-chair of the CACS Caller ID Authentication Working Group. Uh, my fellow co-chair, Thaddeus Johnson, I want to recognize, he's not able to be here today. Uh, he's being represented by Barbara Burton. Um, but Thaddeus, I uh, want to acknowledge that he was, uh, you know, we worked very hard together very closely and he was very actively involved in this process and I just wanted to make sure that he is acknowledged for that. I uh, also wanted to thank Scott and Christina for all of their help in shepherding us throughout this process. Um, it was um, a good amount of work in a short period of time, but I think we uh, came together for a good recommendation. I'm just going to run through uh, it pretty quickly and everyone should have a copy in their folders. So. 
just quickly a uh, review of our working group's charge. Um, I'll just read, you know, we were charged to develop a recommendation to address how the commission and other stakeholders uh, can best educate consumers about the meaning of the shake and stir caller ID authentication framework and what are the most important factors providers should consider for displaying authentication and other information about the call to consumers. And so just a brief overview of our efforts it, to get to a recommendation. Uh, you know, a good amount of time was spent on information gathering, uh, reviewing uh, FCC resources, which were pretty plentiful filings. Uh, there's a robocall summit over the summer, which was very helpful. Uh, researching the many news stories and studies and other events that have been happening on this issue. And as, as we've heard today, it's the, uh, you know, an issue on top of everyone's minds, it seems, in this sector. Uh, and then a, a big part of our information gathering was, like, was hearing from a, a number of stakeholders who are, um, who are part of this process or who are, who are uh, implicated by it, and that included uh, conversations or presentations by AARP, AT&T, CenturyLink, uh, the Secure Telephone Identity Governance Authority, uh, which actually played a lead role in developing the Shake and Stir framework, T-Mobile, uh, TNS. Uh, thank you to Sarah Legan from CTIA, and who was uh, instrumental in facilitating many of these presentations, and also uh, worked very hard on uh, numerous aspects of the process as well. So thank you, Sarah and Vonda as well for facilitating the AT&T presentation. Um, it was very much a group effort uh, in in the uh, process, and then just drafting, editing, finalizing the recommendation. Uh, spent several weeks on it, had a draft, went through many changes, uh, intense editing sessions. Uh, but we came up with a, ultimately a, a draft that was uh, unanimously adopted by our working group. Uh, I think it reflected a, a lot of input from a host of uh, different perspectives. So a very ha we're very happy with the, with the outcome. So just to run through the recommendation itself quickly, uh, in the you know the whereas clauses, the thirteen, <coughs> excuse me, the thirteen whereas clauses, essentially setting out our kind of findings on on the issue around caller ID authentication, uh, you know, framing the problem, which is, as I, as we've heard numerous times today, unwanted robocalls facilitated by caller ID manipulation or, or spoofing primarily. Um, the uh, then teeing up the promise of the shake and stir. Uh, framework, which is which will help combat this issue, uh, and again, as we've heard, this is um, part of a broader strategy um, around combating robocalls because it's an ever mutating um, uh, issue. So, shake and stir is an industry-led standard to enhance call authentication to make sure that um, a means by which uh, calls can be uh, authenticated from the from where they originate. Uh, as I mentioned, part of a broader strategy around combating robocalls. Uh, the findings also include that there are some limitations, at least initially with the shake and stir framework as it rolls out. Um, it'll take some time to kind of be embraced broadly. Uh, initially, it'll work just on IP-based communications, so folks on legacy networks uh, might not benefit, at least initially. Um, and also the, the shake and stir uh, framework itself as we've heard, as we heard from several of our presenters, uh, tends to be most effective when paired with uh, other analytics. Um, so other, other uh, kind of data-driven efforts by carriers themselves or third parties um, to supplement the 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 shake and stir caller authentication framework to help the carriers um, label the calls and 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 show. Um, a consumer, what is coming in, whether it's potential scam or it's verified, um, and carriers are kind of working through how best to uh, present that information to their to their customers. And then finally, uh, you know, there is a big uh, a need for and many uh, roles for robust consumer education around the shake and stir rollout. And so, we. Our uh, recommendations, uh, there are six of them, and I, I, on here they're called resolved clauses just because that's what, where my, my um, 
I always pair resolved with, re with whereas clauses, but they're actually recommendations in the draft itself. So our recommendations include, and I'll just um, kind of walk through them one by one just so everyone can hear it as they read along. Uh, the first recommendation is that voice service providers clearly and proactively inform and educate consumers about the caller ID related services they offer, including caller identification, call labeling and display practices, what information call labels may convey, what action consumers should take relative to each label, uh, the capabilities and limitations of the shake and stir framework, and whether providers offer shake and stir to their consumer to their customers. Um, I believe beginning this month or very soon, it'll be starting to be rolled out by uh, a number of carriers, uh, but not er but not everyone right away. So um, that's certainly relevant. Our second re recommendation um, is that the commission develop web pages and educational campaigns that use uh, simple language, visuals, and videos to provide consumers explanation of, explanations of and resources on Shake and Stir and the th call authentication capabilities and limitations of various voice service networks, uh, for example, IP-based communications and TDM or the traditional copper network, um, and links to voice service providers' websites. Um, and the focus here is on you know, simple language, visuals, and videos, just because these are very technical sounding uh, models and, and principles. So the, the easier it is to convey to consumers, the better, um, just because it is a, kind of a lot to wrap, wrap your mind around. Uh, recommendation three, uh, serv voice service providers maintain customer service and other resources to help consumers and call originators obtain answers to questions and resolve issues related to reports of call labeling, including potential mislabeling. Uh, recommendation four, uh, recommended that the commission keep evaluating how best to encourage voice service providers to continue innovating and improving caller ID services that empower consumers with the relevant call information, which may include additional information along with the combined results of shake and stir and reasonable analytics. Kind of acknowledging that this is an ongoing issue and there'll be uh, a need for continued efforts by service providers to continue um, responding to these uh, malicious activities. Uh, recommendation number five, uh, recommended that the commission, consumer groups, or uh, uh, the commission, FC uh, industry, consumer groups, and other stakeholders conduct studies and solicit input on what factors voice service providers should consider for displaying caller ID information to consumers, uh, including shake and stir verification, caller identity information, telephone number authentication, and other information about the call. Um, recommended that these entities should also evaluate how consumers respond to call labeling, including whether call labels are effective at communicating the authentic authenticated information and prompting consumer action that mitigates harms from illegal and unwanted calls. Uh, we also recommend that these entities should share the information as appropriate in order to promote best practices, uh, recognizing again that um, there'll be uh, any number of ongoing efforts by carriers as they grapple with these issues. Um, and so uh, the more they can share and work together uh, with among themselves as well as other stakeholders, uh, all the better. And finally, last recommendation, that the commission uh, continue to collaborate with industry, consumer groups, consumer ad advocacy groups, uh, federal, state, and local government agencies, and other stakeholders to educate consumers about how caller ID services, consumer display practices, and other measures can respond to evolving illegal and unwanted robocaller tactics, protect consumers, and restore trust in voice services. So that is our recommendation. Okay. Um, um, be before we move forward, um, everyone's received through email the document, and I've noticed that there's a couple missing pages uh, from what was in your folder. Uh, so, um, you know, un un unless, ever, you know, I, I suspect that some of you want to see the entire document. It's the same as it was emailed. So what we could do is we can take a five minute break and have extra copies brought in, um, you know, if that would be helpful. 
are, are we comfortable with just moving ahead then? Because it's, this, it's the same document that was emailed. Okay, I just want to make sure. Uh, apparently there's a page, maybe it was a two-sided page. Oh. Okay, it was printed one-sided. So are we, okay, are we okay then? I just want to make sure everyone, because we can, we can afford a break and bring some copies in. So we're good to go? Michael, I'll turn it back over to you then. Okay, um, so with that then I would move for adoption or a, a vote on our recommendation. I don't know the process. Okay. okay but. So, all right, do we have, we have a second? Second. There's a second sure there, Lynn. I second it. Okay. There we go. Now, discussion. All right, do we have any, um, um, anybody wanna make any points, uh, discuss uh, any issue? With the recommendation? All right. Well, hearing none. Anybody on the phone have an uh, something you want to discuss or, or mention regard to this? Okay. Hearing none. We. Well, then we can. Then, we'll, then we can move on with a vote. Um, do we need to t take another tally to? It, it looks. It looks like we're, we have. We have I think we, we have a quorum. Sixteen this morning when we started, One, two, and two three. on the phone. Yeah, so I think we're looks good. Looks like we still have a quorum. We're good to go. We're good to go then. All right. Okay. All right. So, all right. So with the um, uh, recommendation uh, before you, um, how many uh, are for? Say aye. Aye. Uh, aye. aye. Uh, uh, how many opposed? Uh, anyone online? Okay. I and said aye. Shirley Rooker here. Susan Cranston. Okay, Shirley. Aye. Okay, and, yeah, and Barry, and Barry Mansky's in favor as well. Okay. Uh, abstentions? Any abstentions here, online, uh, on the phone? Okay. So, uh, I guess we have unanimous. Okay. So with that, uh, the recommendation, <coughs> Morris Michael, is passed. Uh, thank you, everyone. Congratulations. So, uh, so we'll, we'll put this into a format, and then I'll send it along to uh, uh, yeah, the commission. Okay. That's great. So thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Nice. Uh, this so, is Shirley Rooker. Let me just say a great big thanks to Michael and Thaddeus, because you all did a bang-up job in leading this group. Absolutely. Yeah. So great news. So that passed. Um, and with that, let's take a break. Uh, we're going to have uh, lunch. Uh, again, I just want to mention uh, a big thanks to uh, CTIA for uh, providing our lunch today. Thank you. Yes, thank you, CTIA. Thank you. Yeah. And let's see, we'll resume at um, 110. All right, we'll see you then. All right. Thanks, everybody. Congratulations. All right, so let's just get started here, and we can wrap up in just a bit. Um, so first, uh, uh, we'll open it up for uh, some discussion. I, I just wanted to uh, remind people of some important dates. Again, uh, we have a special hybrid teleconference and in-person meeting that, again, that will be f uh, February 13th uh, from 2 to 3. Okay, so, and that, that will be for the robocall report working group. Uh, Mostly the, teleconference. Right. Unless you want to show up in person. So our next, our next meeting um, here will then, then is set. Um, it's up in the air. April 17th. It's pr probably April 17th. But that may move to later in the month. Yeah. We understand the NAB has a conference and we're conflicting with it uh, that day. So we may have to move that day, later into it, later April or earlier April, uh, depending upon the facilities availability. Okay, and then the in September there's that's two tentative. Better. Yeah, that's looking better. So it's either <laughs> September 23rd or September 25th. Yep. That's a Wednesday and a Friday. Mm -hmm. yep. So those are the other tentative dates. Yep. So just just make sure we have that in mind. We'll send out an email to try to confirm yeah, we'll things. Do it. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Um, and also, I just wanted to just open it up if anyone had any uh, uh, questions or, or any discussion. Um, there, w there was something that uh, we were talking about, too, in terms of um, 
you, you, um, if we're trying to, um, in the past we ha used to have a lot of working group um, uh, meetings uh, towards the conclusion, and of course people would stay around. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, any ideas about how we might be able to keep people around uh, longer? Uh, would it, for example, coming, starting these at from 10 and going to 3, would that be better or worse for people? I'm just, just wondering, uh, you know, what we could do to try to, to, to keep people around for the, uh, the second half uh, or shortly after lunch. Any thoughts? Any discussion? Someone has an idea? Could okay. it be a working lunch? Oh, the pro the mm. problem with the working lunch is our interpreters need oh. time to eat. Okay. Um, and so we really need to factor that into the process. Um, so we, uh, a working lunch is difficult. Okay. We can shorten the lunch to maybe 30 minutes or 40 minutes, but um, I, I don't know if we can work over lunch as a general rule. Okay. But, but, uh, uh, we, we might be able to do a combination where we have a shorter lunch, and then that second half, that half an hour, we would work. Maybe that might be the compromise. Yeah. Okay, uh, Sarah. I would be fine with just. Sorry. Um, I would be. I would be fine with moving the lunch just that 40 minutes later, because um, I think that the rest of our program is pretty brief. So I think folks could maybe, since we have breakfast available until like 10. Having lunch at one might be not so bad, but because I think it's easier on for some schedules. I don't know about others, but just to be, carve out this full morning chunk, mm -hmm. and then at least you have your afternoon to be able to get back to the office. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. That's yeah. good too. So if we don't have like a, a a working group planned or something like that, then then maybe what we'll do is just push the lunch out. Maybe not have lunch. Or not yeah. have lunch and just. Mm -hmm. I mean that save our mm -hmm. folks money. Yeah. That's and then we'll just, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's possible. Okay, so that, that's a couple ideas. So um, do you um, want well, to say something to I also wanted to mention uh, that this is the last meeting uh, for my colleague, Christina Clearwater, <gasps> oh, as yes. a deputy uh, designated federal officer. She's moving over uh, and has a pr uh, promotion uh, in the uh, uh, Homeland Security and Public Safety oh, Bureau great. as a uh, Deputy Division Chief of Policy and Licensing. Great. Um, and uh, I'm going to miss her, and I know you all will too. Yeah. Uh, she's been an excellent uh, uh, person to work with and has brought a lot of, a lot of knowledge and, and uh, really commitment to the CAC, to the process. And I really do appreciate that. So uh, good luck, Christina, on your future Thank you, Scott. activity. And I know you'll still be a phone call away. And mm -hmm. once in a while, you might drop down and say hello to the CAC. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> it's, it's been a pleasure to work with all of you. I've just really been so impressed with uh, just the hard work and the diligence and dedication that um, I've seen you all of the members uh, display. It's just been so rewarding and, and so valuable. So I, I can't thank you enough for, and I very much enjoyed my time uh, with the committee. So thank you so much. Thank you. And, yeah. and uh, on a personal note, I've so enjoyed working with Scott. He's just such a talent and uh, I'm really gonna miss him. Thanks so much. Thank you. Great. Um, yeah, and I'm sure we'll like to have you back so we can learn about uh, the oh, notifications yeah. that that yes. that we get. Um, oh, now both, I've got both, in the Homeland yes. Security. Yes. Both, yeah, yeah, both the on the those. broadcast and on the texting <laughs> and and yes. and the and and the geo targeting and all that stuff. So yeah. we want to hear more about that and and, yeah. uh, and and also how you get the the 4 a.m. calls. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I'm not looking forward to that portion. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you so much for doing that. When the wireless alerts break, they will call you at 4 o'clock. Oh, in the they morning. will. Or the, the, they there will. you go. Yeah. So, um, and, and also, I, I, I don't, don't, don't want to just um, gloss over it, but uh, like, you know, what we had with um, Thaddeus and, and Michael, the, and, and all the um, uh, 
the working groups, I mean, I can't remember having this many, y you know, uh, unanimous, you know, sort of just com complete, right. yes. you know. Um, and detailed and, and actionable. It's just hard work. Uh, yeah. You know, just getting trust. things through. Uh, yeah. It's just it's just been so amazing. It's just, uh, you know, I remember in the past we, we go through this and, and you get, you know, a group of, you get your, yo, you know, yeses and nos and abstains and all that, but <laughs> this is pretty amazing. I, I have to yes. say, uh, and, and it reflects the really hard work that the, these groups are doing. And so, uh, and so I just wanted to recognize all of you for, for you know, what you've done in the past and what you guys did uh, over this, uh, the, the last couple months. So um, anyways, I, I, I wanted to say that. Also, uh, since we have a, a couple more minutes, if there's anything else that people would like to raise or anyone on the phone, uh, any discussion items, um, any, anything else from the group here? Okay, so not hearing anything there. Uh, so let's turn it over to uh, any comments from the public. Okay. Yes. Hearing none. So um, we have uh, one last presentation, um, and I guess we're waiting for for her just for a couple more minutes, but um, uh, dealing with. Um, uh, I guess online filing. electronic filing, filing in that yes. so licensing filing and that kind of thing. So, mm -hmm. anyways, I guess we're just on hold for a minute. Don't go anywhere. Mm -hmm. It's just like the electronic filing system. Yes. Yes, similar. <laughs> okay. Hey, Brian. Yes. Hi. Hi. Oh, hi. I didn't know you were here. Good to meet you. Me too. You want to get started? Sure. Okay. So, hi. let me, hi. Hi. Let me get this up. Let's see here. Okay. Um, PowerPoint should be in there. Oh, e filing. Here we go. All right. Oh, there we go. All right. So, so we'll start with the presentation then. So, um, with, uh, no further ado, then uh, let me turn it over to uh, Jacqueline Rosen, uh, Honors Attorney, um, Mobility Division, Wireless Telecommunications Bureau. Uh, so, I'm Jacqueline Rosen. I'm an attorney advisor in the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau Mobility Division. And I'll be presenting on our recent uh, September 2019 NPRM, completing the transition to e-filing. So first, uh, this presentation is broken into three sections. The first is an overview of FCC licensing. The second is how licensing works. And the third is the NPRM from this past September. So, the FCC is responsible for managing and licensing spectrum for commercial and non-commercial users, which includes uh, state, county, and local governments. In licensing the spectrum, we promote efficient and reliable access to spectrum for a variety of innovative uses, as well as promotes public safety and emergency response. In terms of wireless and public safety licensing, this includes spectrum that's used to provide voice and data services to consumers, spectrum used to fuel private systems that fuel our, county, our country's business, industrial, critical infrastructure, and public safety needs, and spectrum that's used directly by citizens, which is mainly uh, amateur radio. So how licensing works. To obtain a license from the commission, applicants are required to submit certain forms. Uh, which forms 
they're required to submit depends on which app, uh, license the applicant is seeking. So where do they go? They, there's one system for licensing with wireless and public safety, and then three other systems that complement our licensing activities. Um, in the past, these forms were filed manually, but today most are filed electronically as a result of our efforts to modernize and digitize the commission's filing and retention systems. And the NPRM from September proposes to make the vast majority of our filings electronic. So why electronic filing? Most applications for wireless licenses are already submitted electronically, but the FCC in recent years has taken efforts to modernize our filing and retention systems by improving electronic access and digitizing our communications. And our recent NPRM furthers this in terms of uh, wireless filings in particular. These efforts are valuable to the public because they improve public access to data, decrease costs to consumers, improve transparency and accessibility for a variety of users, save substantial amounts of paper annually, and improve administrative efficiency. So an overview of the wireless licensing systems. There's one system for licensing with wireless and public safety, which is ULS, and then three other systems that complement our licensing activities, which include the antenna structure registration, the tower construction notification system, and E106 system. In terms of trends in filing, uh, we've noticed that in ULS, the majority of uh, applications are already required to be filed electronically, but exceptions exist. In ASR, the majority similarly are filed electronically, but applicants have a choice to file either manually or electronically. And for TCNS, it's an electronic only system uh, similar to E106. So all interactions are electronic by design, but it's a voluntary system, so uh, the tower notifiers aren't required to use the system as a vehicle to uh, fulfill their obligations. Getting into the notice of proposed rulemaking from this past September. So there's three main objectives in the NPRM. Uh, the Proposed changes would first make the majority of wireless filings electronic. Second, require email addresses on the applicable FCC forms. And third, eliminate the remaining correspondence sent by mail. Um, by facilitating the remaining steps to transition our systems from paper to electronic, we're making interaction with these systems more accessible and efficient for those who rely on them, and also reduce uh, licensees' administrative costs. The comments to this uh, were due on October 30th, 2019, and the reply comments were due by November 14th, 2019. So part one would mandate electronic filing. The issue that we saw was in 1998, we mandated electronic filing, but we included exceptions for some applicants like individuals, small businesses, and public agencies that we felt lacked the resources to quickly convert to electronic filing. Um, however, given the changes in internet accessibility and increased personal computer access, we find it unlikely that electronic filing remains infeasible or cost prohibitive. So the solution that we've proposed is to eliminate the exemptions that we had in place previously. Um, some of the considerations that we included in the NPRM, uh, included asking the public to weigh in on whether there's still categories of individuals or entities for which exemptions are warranted, such as small entities, individuals with disabilities, and low-income individuals. We also sought comment on the amount of time necessary to provide filers to prepare for the transition and other implementation issues such as handling confidential information. 
Uh, the second part uh, would be to require email addresses on forms. So it's currently optional but not mandatory for applicants, licensees, and registrants to provide an email address on the relevant forms that are submitted on these systems. Our solution would be to require inclusion of an email address on all forms on all systems. Uh, once inclusion of an email address is mandatory, we proposed uh, dismissing as defective an application where an email address was not included. In terms of considerations, we asked the public to comment on how we can ensure that applicants and licensees keep their email addresses up to date and whether we should add change of email address to the non-exhaustive list of minor modifications. Uh, we also sought comment on whether to require an email address on all pleadings related to applications and filings in these systems and whether there's possible privacy issues related to the collection of email addresses. Lastly, the um, NPRM proposes to eliminate correspondence by mail. In 2014 and 2016, the Bureau took steps to reduce the amount of paper correspondence that were generated by the ULS and ASR system. So first, we converted official le electronic records for authorizations, mailing hard copies only when an entity opted in. Second, we eliminated several categories of notices generated by these systems and sent to users by USPS. Uh, nevertheless, thousands of authorizations and letters are still sent by USPS each year. And this is even though official copies can be accessed electronically and downloaded. Um, in about 80% of these instances, we even had the email address on file. So our solution was as we propose to eliminate requests for the bureaus to mail hard copies, given that the users can access and download their official authorizations, leases, and registrations from the ULS and ASR system at any time. Uh, we also propose to send letters electronically using the email addresses on file. In terms of consideration, we ask the public to comment on whether the commission should maintain an option for individuals to receive paper copies on a case-by-case -case basis. And we also asked whether the commission's waiver process is sufficient to deal with any case-specific needs for uh, paper filings. <coughs> that wraps up the presentation. And if you have any further questions, you can contact me or Jessica Griffinius, who is the Assistant Chief of the uh, Wireless Mobility Division. So thank you for your time. Okay. Um, are there any questions? Um, anyone on the phone have any questions? Steve, I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. Um, Jacqueline, thanks for, for coming today. I really appreciate it. Um, just a quick question. This comes close to home. I've, I've had an amateur radio license since 1968. <laughs> And little did I ever believe when I was scared to death going to the FCC office in Buffalo, New York to be examined by the engineer in charge for my license and all that, whether I'd, I never believed I'd be working for the FCC for almost 20 years. But anyway, uh, the question is this. How would a, if, if you know, and maybe you don't know at this granular level at this time, and that's certainly understandable, how would an, under, uh, an individual for example, wanting an amateur radio license or wanting to renew an amateur radio license, go about doing it? Because uh, I'm going to have to do that in a year or two. <laughs> well, we have uh, our division chief in the back, but and he can correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, ULS manages all of the license applications, modifications, renewals. So that's generally the first place uh, to look. So I would go. I would go into the ULS system and do it there. I, Is that what you're telling yes. me? You think? Yep. Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. And then would I? Would I then? Uh, I could then download a copy of my license then, rather than you sending me one in the mail. Is Correct. that how it's going to work? Yep. Okay. And if I have to take an exam, how? Uh, you know, and somebody's going to certify <laughs> that I you know, there's volunteer. Examiners now uh, 
for amateur radio licenses. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, would how is that going to work? Would the examiner, if you, and maybe you might, might, may not know this for sure, at this point, but would the examiner then have to go also go online and somehow certify that I passed the test as a new applicant? Uh, yes. Is that the way? Okay. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank right. you very much. All right. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Thanks. Thanks. All right. So with that, I think we've wrapped up. We have uh, uh, just one last thing. If there's anyone on the phone or here, uh, any last questions or discussion before w I move to adjourn? Okay. And with that, so then I, I do just that. So I move to adjourn, and I guess, do we need a second? Or? Second. And we're done. No yeah. worries. Thank, Thank you. you very much, everybody. Thanks for coming. We'll send out a, a copy of the, the final recommendation. I think there was a lot of good information. Yeah. yeah.